Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 348 of Spit and Chicklets, presented by Pink Whitney. My friends at New Amsterdam Vodka here in the Barstool Sports Podcast family. Well, gang, it's just me and G here today for the interview only ups to get you through the rest of the summer and into September a little bit. G, how are we doing, buddy? Uh, I'm doing good, R.A. I am down the Jersey Shore, Point Pleasant to be exact. But uh, last night I wasn't doing so hot and I wanted to get your opinion on this. I Last night I went and got a slice of pizza. I ended up deciding I wanted to get a full pie. Then I ended up deciding I wanted to get two full pies. The total price, $75, $78. Each pie was 35 bucks. Have you ever seen anything like that? Um, only in like a place where they got you captive, like at an airport or something like that. But no, was it a, a, like a yuppie pizza place or just a tourist trap? Or it what? was just a, yeah, it was on a boardwalk. Oh, that's ridiculous. $38. Was it worth $38 it? for a plain cheese pizza? All right. Oh, on. That's brutal. They, they don't do, they didn't do us that like in Detroit, G. We were fine in Detroit. Didn't get stiffed like that. So, no. Well, I did mention we got to interview only episodes. Uh, the season ended. You know, there's not much to talk about. We did all the free agency stuff and every hockey media outlet takes a break. And ours just happens to be in August this year because of the pandemic stuff. We do in a little bit. We have New Jersey Devils legend Ken Danico played his entire season. There has his number in the rafters, three Stanley Cups, absolute legend of the franchise. Uh, we're going to bring him on in a little bit. Uh, first, though, we do got a few more weeks of summer left here. And then we usually get some nice weather into September. Well, Whenever you declare your summer over, be sure to head over to your local bar and make sure you order some Pink Whitney. It's the perfect shot for you and all your friends. Gee, any Pink Whitney this weekend down Jersey or what? Too much Pink Whitney, R.A., too much Pink Whitney. I had a, had a blast this weekend down the Jersey Shore. Yeah, I, it's such a, I think, a place that maybe its reputation precedes it from that goofy show a few years back because I had a wedding there a few years ago, man. I was blown away how beautiful the Jersey Shore is. I'm officially a Jersey Shore stan. All right. I say this all the time. I, I actually grew up in my parents. It's kind of funny. I say this, but we would drive through New Jersey and they'd be like, all right, going through the armpit of America, like hold your breath, kids. And so I, I always had the perception. And then the show came out that the Jersey Shore sucked. It was this gross place. But I've come down here for the past three summers. And I think this place is unbelievable. It's so nice. The nightlife is unbelievable. The food is great. And the people are awesome, too. So yeah, I can't suggest it enough. Manisquan, Point Pleasant, Belmar, hit up DJs. It's it's the best down here. Years ago, my my uncle brought his new girlfriend to meet the family, and I was like a little jokester, like ten years old. I was telling jokes Shocker. I probably shouldn't shouldn't have been and learning jokes. I probably shouldn't have known, but I was like, hey, what's the difference between trash and New Jersey? And uh, the girls, oh, I said, what's the difference between trash and girls from New Jersey? She's like, what? I was like, trash gets picked up, and she's like, ha, huh, I'm from New Jersey. I was like. <laughs> I was like 10. I was like, ah, oh, Jesus. Yeah, she's my aunt now. I think she forgave me in the meantime. So, well, it's funny a- too, because like anytime in college, someone would be like, oh, I'm from New Jersey. I could be like, oh, I could smell you when you walked in. And it's like, I'm down here all the time now. It's like my girlfriend actually always makes fun of me. She's like, you love the Jersey Shore because I do. This place is amazing. And yeah, one of the best TV shows ever set in that state, too. Sopranos. Can't beat it. Unbelievable. Wait, all right. What do you think of the yeah. prequel? Oh, I can't wait. The Many Saints in Newark, uh, the, that first trailer preview got me excited. I, I think it's a brilliant casting choice having his son play the younger version of him because, you know, that kid, I don't think he trained to be an actor all that much until the last few years, but I've seen him in a couple of things and I, I think he's been impressive so far. And He takes he a lot of a balls lot. to take that role too, you know? Huge. And, uh, and I think though, he's almost got a, uh, like a genetic advantage because he's just got the same ticks as his father. Like he does, he's not a dead ringer for him, but you can see so much of him, just the way he talks and stuff. So very, very excited for the many saints in Newark. A lot of other good movies too, but uh, before we do send it over to Mr. Devil himself, we do want to let you know that cross country mortgage is much like us at Boston. It's a people first group of people. They're dedicated to the fundamentals of mortgage lending, which results in a fast, convenient, and less stressful home financing or refinancing experience. And right now, rates are unbelievably low. Don't pay the bank more money than you need to. CCM makes the process as painless and simple as possible. It helps keep money in your pocket so you can still do fun things like it, like take road trips to see your favorite hockey team. If you're a homeowner and haven't refied lately, you could be leaving thousands or even tens of thousands of dollars on the table. And that's money that could go toward a new shed toy or just some pocket cash or whatever. Take the kids on a little roadie. So call today for a fast, free, great quote and free home valuation. Go to crosscountrymortgage.com slash Bostool to learn more about your future home buying experience or refinance your current mortgage. Cross Country Mortgage, LLC, 
NMLS number 3029, all loans subject to underwriting approval, www.nmlsconsumeraccess.org. All right, gang, if you are looking, CCM Cross Country Mortgage, great folks there. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to bust that mask out in Detroit. A uh, little tough getting getting together at the last minute, but I, I think was, I think the old school mask worked better with the, uh, with the, the kit I had, G. I, I was going to ask you, how's the body feeling? I know the ribs were hurting. You weren't feeling too hot after it. Yeah, um, I'm feeling a lot better. I think it was Thursday or Friday where I woke up, and the first thing I didn't think of was was the ribs because I think travel when you're carrying a bag for all the airports, it, that kind of re-aggravated whatever I did. But, uh, yeah, today I got up, hadn't even thought about it until you mentioned it. So whatever whatever I chopped up is uh, feeling good right now. So. Well, this is it officially the end of RA and goalie? Like, will we ever see it again? No. No, I mean okay. – no, okay. definitely not. No, I, I, uh, you know, I think there's probably a, a better goalie to be had next time we have one of these tournaments. I'm sure there's probably somebody better. I'm glad I did it. I, I, I don't know though, it. dude. I don't know. We tried that the next day with Biz, and he and he stunk. Yeah, oh, I mean, yeah, he, poor guy couldn't go down because of his screwed up knee. But I didn't even know that when I asked him. But oh, I didn't I even mean, think of that. I, I, yeah, I typically don't say never say never, but uh, I typically don't mean it. But yeah, I, I don't think I'm gonna play goalie again I, after that. I, I think that was a fun way to go out. Went out with a bang. You know, probably a it's been interesting to think about where we're going to do these next too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, I mean, there's so many great cities. And like I said, Detroit was I, almost like a dry run. It was like, all right, let's, tr- let's try this here, see how it works. And, and it, it went unbelievable. So uh, I, it's, it's crazy that, and it's, it's, I'm, I'm, I feel stupid to say this, but I didn't really realize hockey town was such a hockey town. Like I didn't realize like how many people were going to come out from all across Michigan yeah, I, I was surprised. Not just Michigan, too. I mean, guys from yeah. Seattle drove up from Florida. I mean, people came from all over the place. And that that's what I, I was impressive, too, Mike. It wasn't even like we were giving away like a $10,000 prize or anything like that. It was just, hey, come play hockey. And, you know, people came there, spent their own dime, came there on their own time. And and that's what I, I don't I, I thought was great over anything is that people, you know, it wasn't even a, it was a, a trophy and bragging rights. And, and people came from all over just for that. So it, it's a it's a tribute to us, I think. And what we lost and what we threw that all, all these people came. And I, again, we can't thank them enough. It was uh, an unreal weekend up there. All right, gee, I think that's enough jibber jab. We said we we're going to bring the folks, Mr. Devil Ken Danico. So without further ado, here is Mr. Ken Danico. Enjoy. Well, it's a pleasure to welcome our next guest to the show. The second draft pick ever by New Jersey, this defenseman played his entire 20-season NHL career with the Devils. He won three Stanley Cups, had his number three retired, and he's played more games than anyone else in team history. You can also catch his analysis on both MSG Plus and the NHL Network. Thanks a bunch for coming in to see us. Ken Danico, how's it going, Dano? My pleasure. Pretty hard to believe, right? Uh, the most games played for the New Jersey Devils. <laughs> I knew my role. I understood that I was not the most talented, but uh, it was a a great two way street. I, I feel very grateful and fortunate, and great to be with you guys. But uh, to play my entire career with one team means a whole lot to me. The Devils have been family; they've been my everything, and now I still call the games. I've been with them thirty eight years now. Whether it's a That's player crazy. or in the organization in some capacity. Whatever they ask me to do, because <laughs> they've treated me pretty well since a 19-year-old buck who didn't know where New Jersey was when I was drafted. And you guys didn't even have a team name at the <laughs> time when you got drafted, yeah. right? That's true, Biz. I, it was New Jersey. So I get the call. We Let's start. Here we go. <laughs> so I got got some good stories. So, And I've told this many times, but not on your, your yeah. platform and all the listeners you have. So we'll tell a lot of stories that will be repeated, but... A lot of people haven't heard. Oh, them, so. I haven't heard them. So <laughs> yeah, let's go. Nineteen eighty-two, first rounder, no big deal. You know, and <laughs> I wasn't expected to go there. Believe me, and I, it was a shock. But uh, the Devils, there's no team name yet. You're right, Biz. I mean, they just moved from Colorado. They're the Rockies, not a very good team or organization at the time. And the late great John McMullen, our owner at the time, had owned the Houston Astros mm-hmm. as well, the baseball team, and. Wanted to bring professional hockey, the NHL, to New Jersey. So he buys the team, brings them to New Jersey. People are going, what are you doing? There's already two teams in the area. You're paying way too much. And back then, I think he was paying $15 million for the team, 1982. And $15 million, which people thought was ludicrous for uh, 
for the rights because uh, area rights, Philadelphia, Rangers, Islanders kind of thing. So he kind of had to pay five extra million. To, wow. To oh, just because there was already so many teams in the yeah, area. Right, right. And Did just, that go to the other teams? I believe so, yeah. Wow. I mean, that, you know, don't quote me on that exactly, but in that ballpark, and I believe, because I was very close with our owner and he was, he was such a wonderful guy, tree, like a second father to me. And uh, that's a big a reason for my loyalty as well, as loyal as they were to me. I mean, I could do no, no wrong under the owner's eyes, and we'll get in some other stories with that, <laughs> him and Lou and everything. But um, because I was his first pick, and I was a guy that wanted to make a difference, wanted to be part of a foundation. We weren't good, like I said. Came to New Jersey. So 1982, the draft, June, it's in Montreal. I get a call early. I, I'm all nervous the night before. Go out with my brother uh, for a few Diet Cokes. <laughs> you know, to ease the tension, as they like to say. You know, I was nervous. Like any young kid, it's been my dream. I'm sure you guys went through a biz and, and went as far as... I told my mother seven times a day, or, or ten times a day since seven years old, I'm going to play in the National Hockey League. And that's not a word of a lie. I said it every day to her until the point where my mother used to... Shake her head and say, yeah, yeah, Kenny, I know. And, and she'd pacify me, but didn't know if that was if I was being realistic. You know, there's 10 Ken Danicos where I grew up in Edmonton, Alberta, on every corner, on every pond, on every ice rink. So she thought maybe I was shooting a little bit high, but I kept telling her, you know, I'm going to play in the National Hockey League. I'm going to play. And, and in fact, in third grade, I'm at school with my, my teacher. I remember the name now because she was actually related to Norm Allman, and her name was Miss Allman. And she called my mother up one day and, and said, uh, your son, Kenny, is pretty good in school. He finishes his work relatively quickly, the test, but he says, then he bothers the other students as far as he's disruptive because he tells every kid in the class he's going to play in the <laughs> National <laughs> Hockey League. <laughs> Say, okay, okay, Ken, okay. you spoke it into true existence. <laughs> true story, true story. And my mother says, don't you dare burst his bubble. I'll, I'll tell him about the disruption. He's got to take it easy. Even though my mother thought the same thing. Maybe he's, he's you know, is this kid nuts, you know? He, he, really not going to make the National Hockey League. This is a small percentage. I know he's pretty good and, and, and at his level right now. But So I told her that. And, and to fast forward, you know, obviously uh, go play junior and, you know, doing pretty good in Edmonton in minor hockey and go play junior and before we get to the draft. So at 15 years old, I, I, I developed quickly. And I'm, I'm big physically and – Played Bantam AA in Edmonton and they're very competitive. The likes of Kenny Ramchuk, who went seventh overall that year. And Jim Benning was the year before, 1981. Had a lot, Just that's just to name a few guys that were just real good players in Edmonton growing up in minor hockey. So there was a lot of competition. But from Bantam AA, I was supposed to go to Midget. Well, your rights are owned by a junior team. It was the Great Falls Americans at the time. No draft or anything. They just kind of snag you when you're 15, 14 years old and say, you, you belong to us. The big team was the Portland Winter Hawks with... Gary Nyland and Ken Ramchuk in my era and uh, guys along those lines. And um, so Great Falls, I mean, now this is a bad team too. You know, I, I just, bad teams seem to follow me for whatever reason. But they snag me and again, giving me an opportunity. And they call me up and say, we'd like you to skip midget, go right to tier two hockey. And we're affiliated with a team called the Yorkton Terriers in the Saskatchewan Junior Hockey League. And... My mother says, over my dead body, you're leaving at 15 years old. I know times were a little different back then because I know in today's day and age, I would have never let my 15-year-old kid yeah. go. So young to be Leave leaving. home. It was 500 miles away. My dad was born and raised in Germany, more of a soccer guy, came to Canada at 22 years old, learned to love the game, but, but didn't know a whole lot about it. But he was just supportive. I'm a man of few words, still living Hanging in there at 90 years old. Oh, wow. and, yeah, so, and I, I want to go see him soon because he's yeah. in Canada, and you know, with all oh, yeah. the travel bullshit. Our yeah. unprecedented times and COVID and the travel, and travel crap. So, anyway, but uh, he was just one of those guys that took me to those early morning practices, supporting me, not that pushy parent whatsoever. He just saw the passion I had for the game. So, when this time came to make a decision, I had two days. I had a weekend to say, the coach is going to pick you up if you're interested in going on Monday at a gas station and drive you to York in 500 miles. <laughs> and the coach's name, uh, he's passed since then to Jerry Bullets and, and just a wonderful man. So my dad goes, what do you want to do? I said, Dad, well, I've said I'm going to play in the National Hockey League for 50 times a day, 10 times a day, whatever it may be, since seven years old. So I think this is probably the best thing for, for me to pursue. And 
I'm willing to go to Yorkton. You know, a lot of guys get homesick. I was like, whatever it took, I'm going to take that next step. I don't care. I said, but there's a problem. You know mom's not going to be too happy with this decision. In fact, she's probably going to try to squash it and say, no way. My dad goes, listen, I'm going to drive you to the gas station. True story. Uh, On Monday, we're not going to tell your mother. He says, I'll deal with her because I don't want to tell her right now and it's going to be too much. Shit show, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so basically, we're just we're just going to have you leave. We're going to just have you leave and hug, say goodbye to your So I kind of gave her a hug, but my wife didn't stabbing. know exactly what was going on. <laughs> didn't know exactly what was going on. I get picked up by Jerry Bullis, drive to Yorkton, and obviously after a couple weeks, my mother got over it. My dad said, Look, you know, explain the whole story. He's told you since seven years old he's going to play in National Hockey League. If this is the path he thinks it's going to take, let's do it. Now, going to Yorkton as a 15-year-old kid, I was one of two 15-year-olds in the league at the time. It was a man's older league, league man's, man's league, league, from 17 and a lot of 18, 19-year-olds. That's a, that's a big discrepancy, as oh. you guys know. So this was survival of the fittest. This is in the late 70s. This is not that far from Slapshot, this league. And that's not an exaggeration. We, we all love that movie, oh, right? Yeah. We all get a, a laughs and, 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 and look at the way the game was played back then and the craziness. Yeah, there was a lot of great players. Chris Chelios came from that league with the Moose Jaw Warriors, so I played against him. Dave Tippett, the coach of the Islanders, or the Oilers, and, and I could go on with names. But also the likes of Dave Brown, Joe Kosher came out of the Sketch oh. and Junior League. So oh my God. I, I guess you know where I'm headed. So it was survival of this. I'm on a young team in Yorkton, 15 years old, and I, I'm a baby. I'm are fit. you, sorry, quickly, are you like 200 pounds? Are you, are you, what's your at least 15 size? 15 years old, I'm, yeah, I'm 190. So wow. big enough to defend yourself, but, yeah. but still a, big enough a, a, and, ba- and a, a little minnow. squirrely enough to understand that. This is what it's going to take. But <laughs> nervous is all hell at times going into certain games because yeah. uh, we, we'd be playing. You know, we had we were a lot of 17-year-olds. A lot of teams had 19-year-olds and 18-year-olds. And Melville Millionaires were our big rival 20 minutes up the road. We were the Yorkton Terriers. They were coached by Jerry James. And we swear at times we'd drive up there and they, they brought four guys right out of prison just to play against us. <laughs> And, and, you know, and, and like I said, as much as I'm exaggerating, it, it was to the big full beards. And I'm a 15-year-old kid going, what did I get myself into? They had guys that would skate all the way to our blue line and wouldn't let it. We'd have to warm up from the blue line in. They had a guy sit on our net once during warm-up. Jeez. I mean, I could go on and like, I'm going. Well, you're already pot committed because you told everyone back <laughs> home you're going to make the NHL. You're like, what the fuck did I sign up for here? <laughs> I was pot committed, business. No question about it. 60-game season and. So I, I'm going to high school there as well. I, I, after after day at school, we'd have to go play Melville. There'd be 12 guys in the bus. I go, where is everybody? Oh, didn't you know it's called the blue flu? They don't come to this game. <laughs> oh, legit? Like the Swear. tutu flu. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it sounds crazy. Sounds far-fetched. True story. I'm going. So we're going into Melville with 12 guys, you know. He goes, oh, Kenny, and by the way, we're probably going to have 60 to 70 players this year because guys go home, homesick, or can't handle the league. It's just too too nasty, too physical, too much fighting, too much craziness. I look great. I'm just sitting there as a young kid. This is just this great. Is but, you know, I'm rolling with the punches. We had Wendell Clark's brother, another – he passed way too young, Don Clark, who I lived with. He was a 17-year-old. He was the captain of our team. Just a, just a great guy. and. You know, passed over the last couple of years, and it was real sad. Uh, but anyway, Don really took me under his wing, and you know, 15 to 17 is a big, big difference. And he he was a big physical guy. He was our toughest guy. He was in no surprise. His last name's Clark, right? You know how oh, tough Wendell Clark was. Uh, so he took me under his wing, and he was the guy that I'd watch him go into Melville with that bounce, that cockiness, he didn't care. He was standing up for the team. And I kind of followed him into the battle, into the fray, and I'd get my you-know-what kicked many, many times. Were you fighting in minor hockey at all, or was that your first Not, experience of scrapping uh, to that extent? First experience scrapping to that extent, but I'd, you know, had a few tussles as a kid in school and all those kinds of things. And I was always a guy that, I, and I say this sincerely, like I – I, I never really was a guy that would start anything. I wasn't an aggressive kid, but believed in myself physically. I mean, I was the guy that hated bullies in school. I hated bullies. And when they would pick on uh, some of the kids that uh, were 
were too weak to defend themselves, right? I would be, I'd be that kid that stepped in. I just always had that in my DNA, yep. in my nature when I was younger. Got suspended from school once because of it. They called my mother in middle school. You know, there was a group of the really smart kids that just, you know, weren't athletic, weren't physically capable. And you'd get certain kids, you know, that the, the morons that would pick yeah. on kids for no reason. I hated that. I just, it tore me up. And so they, I know we're going all over the map yeah, here, no, but this is kind of leading to That's what we do here. Learn- <laughs> yeah, we go everywhere. I appreciate it, guys. Yeah. Learning, that's where I kind of learned to, to put, channel my physicalness, my size, my aggression. athleticism, aggression in the right way. So anyway, I I walk out so that you know how schools have uh, portable classes as yeah. well. I walk out and I see three young kids getting picked on in middle school, and I think I was eighth grade at the time, and they're getting picked on. And I walk out there, and there's about four of them, and I go. <laughs> I go, you leave them alone. You know, it's none of your business. You know, they knew who I was, and obviously because I was very athletic in the school and pretty good size. So just leave them alone, you know. And I'm going, what am I doing? Because, you know, there's kids that are probably going to, you know, give me a little bit of a whooping here. I, I, I was outnumbered, and I'll never forget it. And, and sure enough, things get a little out of hand. I did pretty good. By the way, <laughs> and I say that humbly because this wasn't my intention. My intent, it was all because I, I, I didn't like bullying. Principal gets the wrong story. All the school gets the wrong story. They call my mother a petite little lady who's passed on since for a long time now of five one. Hated fighting, hated anything to do with that aspect. Even with hockey, she knew I was physical, but didn't like the fighting aspect. So, Mom, I, I, I think I did it for the right reasons, and I know they're suspending me for a day while the – Apparently the whole story came out. Principal called me back and or called my mother back. Says, "You know what? We're we're letting your son back in because we heard exactly what had transpired." Good. I don't condone it. I don't ever want him fighting in school again. But he was protecting. Yeah. You're doing it for the right reasons. Doing it for the yeah. right reasons. And, yeah. I, and I still this day hate bullying. You know, and yeah. I know yeah. that's a big problem with with kids in school and on with social media and the internet. That that is a I, I'm a big advocate for just hit it and I had that as a young age. I'm kind of proud of that because I did have that in my DNA because I did have the physical prowess to do something about it even at a young age. Okay, now we're going to take a little break with a word from our friends at Roman. Now that the world's opening back up, so many new thrills are on the horizon. And whether you've been in a relationship for years, are just getting started, or excited to get back out there and meet new people, when the moment comes, you want to be ready. Roman ready. Go to GetRoman.com slash Barstool now to talk with a U.S. licensed healthcare, healthcare professional. With Roman, you can get a free online evaluation and ongoing care for erectile dysfunction, all from the comfort and privacy of your own home. Roman ready equals confidence. The confidence that you know you can rise to the occasion in the moment. We're looking at a new summer love and Roman wants to make sure you can participate in your way, whether that be as a single person or a couple who would rather stay with each other. Nothing wrong with that. And it's a nice, simple process. Roman finds the best treatment plan for you. And if medication is appropriate, it ships to you free with two day shipping and getting started is simple. Just go to getroman.com slash Bostel and complete an online visit. Take care of your ED without leaving your home. Complete an online visit today to connect with a U.S. licensed healthcare professional and take care of it. Once again, go to GetRoman.com slash Barstool today. And if you're prescribed, you get 50% off your first month of ED treatment. Make sure you're ready to have confidence and control this summer. Roman ready. And now, back to Ken Danico. Back to our story going to junior hockey. So that was my only... <laughs> <laughs> no, I like I'm it. I'm all no, over, Biz. No, it but tells then, us why you, why you always defended yeah, your teammates yeah, yeah. and maybe it stemmed from when you were a, so, a young kid. A, a kid. So I go to junior as a 15-year-old. Now, I, I'm biting off more than I can chew. Because there's, there's big boys. There's guys that can handle themselves. But I had a little, little bit of that just naturally in my DNA, as you did, Biz, I know. Uh, which you did not National yeah, yeah. Wait, wait, I wanted your talent, brother. Yeah. I wanted your skill. Yeah. We all, we all, we could have been a hell of a mixture. We danced with the one that brought us, right? Yeah, as, absolutely. As they exactly. say. absolutely. Uh, dance with the, but you the ankles stick. that brought me. I know. Me. I saw you. I played against you. you yeah, know? yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, and I had Donnie Clark, who who was mentioned Wendell's brother, the captain of our team, just always had my back, and he would prepare me for certain teams and certain games. You know, it's going to get nasty, Melvin. Just 
If you have to hang on for dear life, hang on for dear life. Do whatever you have to do to survive. So we were a bad team, but I played all 60 games that year. And, you know, I knew that was that was part of my progression. That was part of my start to, to I have to get through this. I can't quit. I can't quit. You didn't anything. miss one game. Didn't miss one game. Did you get game. homesick at all? You know what? I, I was just uh, – you, you do a little bit, but I, I was just so focused and zoned in on, on – Making the NHL. Making the NHL, what I was going to do. So I was one of those rare guys, and now this is my path. This is my path. I was ready to leave. I was ready to do whatever it took. And, you know, I look back and, and obviously you reflect, and I, I look at guys that were so much more talented than me or better players, and I always go – they or had a cup of coffee at the International Hockey League, I go – how didn't he have a great career? He was so good in junior. He was dominant. He was way better than me. And, and you understand, the, you learn and you reflect and you go, but if you don't have the want and the will and the drive to absolutely, you know, do whatever it took, you, you're not going to get to this level where, what is it, one, two percent make it, guys, of, of any all the kids that actually play hockey and, and have that dream of playing in the National Hockey League. So, I knew I had to be that guy to go the extra mile, to never quit, to work extremely hard, to do whatever it took to, to play. Now, going to my, uh, you know, so that started. Then I went to the Western High. I played one year in Yorkton. Uh, one other story, too, so in Yorkton about the fighting thing. So I go into Swift Current, and I remember the guy's name even. I, a guy named Gord Cullum, who was known as the toughest guy in the league, you know, as far as fighting, but was a very honorable respectful guy wasn't a you know wouldn't just grab a guy for the sake of grabbing a guy and you know beating the the crap out of him so jerry bolts i i'm in swift current early on in my in the season in front of the net give him a little cross check he kind of told me kid take it easy sort of thing well i proceed to challenge him and drop my mitts and so he threw a punch over my you know grazed my top of my helmet I'd still be laying there like it was Joe, Joe Kosher type, but he was an 18-year-old kid that had a lot of experience in the fisticuff area. And I just survived it, basically. And, and he just, like I said, grazed me with one, and I fell and blah, blah, blah. So I go back to Ben's Jerry Bullets goes to me, the coach. He goes, Kenny, he says, do you know who that is? <laughs> so, no, why? Like he goes, well, that's probably the toughest – best fighter in, in the Saskatchewan Junior Hockey League, and I suggest we start a little bit lower. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I go to him, thanks for telling me now. Yeah, like, yeah, I guess, yeah. you're telling me this now. There was no game <laughs> notes back then. This is Army's <laughs> checking game notes. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. They, they, had to, like, they had to, like, carve it into the stall in the bathroom, like, watch out for this maniac. <laughs> no, I, you maybe tell me that before the game. You yeah. know, I was kind of naive and a little bit clueless at the time he says but you got through it but i i suggest you don't do that again i said you don't have a problem with me i'm not I, i'm gonna wait till i'm 18 if i ever go to gore cullum again but only played in the Saskatchewan junior league one year ended up going great falls moved to spokane we were the spokane flyers played there a year and a half where one of my teammates was dave brown at the time for his oh. short stint and uh he kind of took care of everybody at the did time. I but he was a gangly guy back then. Did I hear a story? Was it you guys who, who basically they had to create the rule where you couldn't warm up with the other team? Wasn't it, <laughs> was it not Dave Brown who, who started it one day with, with with another team? He like went down and like stole their net or something? Yeah, yeah very, very possible. I don't think it was in my, my time with him because he was still a young buck kind of crafting his tool at oh, the yeah, time. Yeah. And, and I liked Dave Brown, and I actually fought him a couple times in the early 80s and wasn't very fond of that. I go, Brownie, we used to be friends, and he'd come frothing at me. <laughs> yeah, he but that's the, shit, Flyers, right? <laughs> that's the Flyer-Devil rivalry. But I went to Spokane a year and a half, and, and we folded. So, you know, this is this is a grind here. Here I am going, moving away at 50, and then I go to Spokane. We're in a very good team, but we end up folding a year and a half in December. Then there's a dispersal draft. And I end up getting taken by Seattle, so I'm going, you know, I go home over Christmas, have a couple weeks off. My mom goes, is this really worth it? I mean, you're, things haven't gone as smoothly as maybe, <laughs> or transitioned the way we would have. Like I said, no, Mom, it doesn't matter. I'm going to go wherever they send me, whatever I have to do. And went to Seattle, loved it there. Now they have a pro team, boys. Yeah, yeah the yeah, Seattle Kraken. So I can't wait to get back there because I haven't been there since 18 years old. And. You know, had a had a good run there for a year and a half, and, and my draft year comes 1982. I'm ranked from what I hear. You know, there's no the internet and no real rankings and 
Yeah, back then it was carrier Where we pigeon. know, they know when you go to the bathroom now, or oh, God, yeah. what you yeah. ate, what you drank, what you've said, what everything about your what life What weed now. you're smoking. Yeah, so. if you're Stevie, <laughs> exactly. if you're Stevie Your whole Wye. lifestyle, they, they went by a scout. There would be a scout that would watch one in particular guy. They put their jobs on the line. So I'm 18, I'm thinking, I'm cautiously optimistic I'm going to get drafted, but I'm taking nothing for granted because I don't know, you know. Certainly not ranked in the first round. There was 21 teams at the time in the National Hockey League back in 1982. Drafts in Montreal. Phone rings relatively early. So it's maybe 840. The draft went a lot quicker, by the way. You know, they call the names and you move on. And only first rounders went to the draft back then. Your agent wouldn't fly in. They weren't wasting I any money. I made that mistake. I went there, and, <laughs> and, and I didn't get picked on the first day. I sat there the whole day, Ken. Well, well, I'm Edmonton, Montreal. I would have had to pay my own way, but your agent would fly a, for, a definite first rounder to the draft back then in a whole different landscape. So, obviously, my agent didn't think I was going to the first round. Neither did I, but uh, the, the phone rings early. My mom says, Kenny, wake up. I'm a little groggy. I was out a little late and all nervous before the draft. She was just come take this call. I go, Mom, it's a friend playing a prank or a couple of friends. I look at the clock, one peek out of the corner of my eye, it's like 8 40. I go, No, nah, no, nah. hey, Mom, it's too early. The drafts just started. She goes, Just come down here. Kenny, take this call. I pick up the phone, groggy voice, go, Hello. Uh, Hi, Ken. Congratulations. Uh, we've just taken this is Marshall Johnson. We've just taken you 18th overall in the National Hockey League draft. Wow. I dropped the phone. <laughs> dropped the phone. Didn't ask the team, didn't know who. I dropped the phone, you know, the excitement like a little kid. You've Tears been saying this your whole life. Waiting for this my whole life, saying this my whole life. Tears coming out of my eyes. I go, I go to my mother. I go, you're not going to believe this. I just went 18th overall. My mother, who's never swore in her life, said, you've got to be <laughs> bleeping me. <laughs> no <laughs> way. Yeah, I swear to God. <laughs> my mother, I've never heard, I never, nice Catholic lady went to church, yeah, never yeah. has sworn. Like she was flabbergasted because all she heard and was sick of hearing was, yeah. You're going to play in that shocker. <laughs> now, this is only the first step getting drafted, but to get drafted 18th overall, that high. She goes, Well, ask who it is. I pick up the phone because it's on the floor. I go, Oh, by the way, who is this? Didn't care. I did not yeah. care. You know how guys pick and choose where they want to go. And who they want. I didn't care if it was Siberia. <laughs> they were going to give me a chance to play, you know? So I go, yeah, by the way, who is this? They go, it's New Jersey. They didn't have a team name. I cover up the phone. I go to my mother. Where's New Jersey? <laughs> Swear to God, I'm from Western Canada, you know, way out in Edmonton. I knew it's near the big city somewhere, but I didn't know geographic, geographically exactly where it was. I had no idea where New Jersey was, and they didn't either, quite frankly. So they, it was, you know, it was a thrill lifetime. I would have ran the two thousand miles to get the. What a memory! They were still picking the team name. It was a vote in the paper, and eventually became the Devils, obviously. And what were the other options? You remember? Uh, Generals, uh, Meadowlanders. Oh, oh Devils is perfect. <laughs> yeah, Devils. Yeah, because there was a lot. Devils, and the fans yeah. were the actual ones. That's what I love about it. Fans are your team, part of your family. I never take that for granted, even to this day. And Whit, I think you know him, busy guys. Like I, I, I just. I have time for every fan of any team because of this what this great game's done for me and I have a love hate with them. And <laughs> <laughs> just yeah, I, I see some stuff on social media. I yeah, see the love yeah, hate. Just, but yeah, just. but I, I just respect fans because they are your family. And without the fans, we're nothing. And and I mean that sincerely. No, true. If even if that sounds all corny or pleading the fans, I do. I it, every New Jersey Devil fans probably had a picture with me or uh, fifty times. Mr. Or an Devil, that's your nickname, Mr. Mr. Devil. But having said that. I do it because you know I I I really you come 360 as a player you don't understand it and you you know I, I kind of think I'm the same guy that that was drafted to, to this day even after a long career and fortunate to be part of three Stanley Cup championships. But I, I always look at now and because of social media and because of what I talked about bullying and things that go on in life now and and it, it means something to me when a fan comes up or tweets me says you made my day because you took that picture. I don't know what's going on. Now I, I, I reflect, and I don't know what's going on in that fan's day. They may be having the worst day. It may be deep. It may be something serious. And if that one picture or that one autograph or interacting with them for 20 seconds changes their mood and what's going on in their life, that means something. That has mm -hmm. an impact to me now. So that's why I, I look at it that deeply now. Because yeah. I used to go, oh, God, this person's had my picture probably 10 times, probably 20 times. And then they'll reach out on social media and say, you know what? 
I was having a bad day. You know, and when you see that, it's heartwarming because you go, yeah. you know what? They may be going through a lot here. Yeah. And we don't know what's going on in their life. It may be way deeper than I even imagine. And if that helped alter something that yeah. could have happened dramatically bad or they weren't doing good, it means something to me. And so I drafted 82. I just had to throw that in. You know, I'm going all over the map. No, no, no. Kind of like Scotty. It's, <laughs> it's, that seems to be the, the theme with the New Jersey imagine Devils. The, imagine the Devils. My buddy Scotty. Guys. Guys. <laughs> They're all just talking to themselves. You know, something comes to your, your, your oh, mind, yeah. and, and I'm I want to make sure too. I got that out there about the fans. And I could care less who you vote for. Yeah, I'm, I bleed Devils red. I, when fans come up to me, because I do the NHL Network and, and cover the league, and I have so much respect for every organization, Fans everywhere, and, and certainly the, the, the incredible talent throughout the league and players. You're a fan of your team. doesn't mean you have to root for me or my team yeah. just because I'm a devil's guy, but I love the passion of fans. They're like, hate your team, hate you. I'm okay. That's okay. Yeah. I, I, I have such respect for every fan, and you root for your team. I'm a sports fan, too, of, of other sports, and I root for my team, whoever that may be. You know. What was uh, your first training camp like in the NHL? Uh, very similar. Again, we'll go to the rookie games, Biz. I'm sure you were involved in the wit. The, they they got a little slap shotty. <laughs> the movie cigarette break. <laughs> uh, it was great. I mean, I was thrilled to be there. Obviously, very nerve wracking. But I had the attitude. I'm going to make the team right now. You know how some 18 year old kids come in. I know I'm going back to junior. I was going to get noticed. That's and that's what I relay to kids today. Any of the Devils prospects come in. I said, don't come in tentative. I'm not saying you have to be arrogant. The big difference between arrogant and belief and, and cocky, it's more about, you know, come in there with a little swagger. Show them you belong. You might not make it that year or that year, but you have to get noticed. Because I see so many young kids come in tentative. Oh, I came in like I belonged, like right away. And I was going to fight. I was going to be physical because that was part of getting noticed. We played in those rookie games against the Flyers, against the Rangers. I mean, a lot of times those were somewhat bloodbaths. I remember I go back. The rookies on the Flyers back then, maybe not my first year, but the second year because he came in when I was a ninth. It was Craig Berube, Rick Tockett, so all these guys. Are, and I love now, and you become friends, guys you hated when you oh, played yeah. against. And I f fought them all, and those were the guys that were kind of my arch nemesis at the time because that was our rivalry, so I had to go through all those guys, or Dave Brown and all them. And you you become good friends because you find out you're a lot alike 10 years after your career when mm -hmm. – I w if I saw them in a restaurant, I wouldn't even – I'd walk out because you hate yeah. – you know the oh, hatred back for your, and, yeah. and, and there was no trades or not many trades going on. Yeah. People weren't switching organizations like they did. <laughs> and and we've talked to older guys before. Like they wouldn't – if they were at a charity golf tournament or something and there was a guy from another team, mm -hmm. they wouldn't even sit at the same table. They would – they would you know, <laughs> they'd find their way across the room. Same experience. I would walk out. I couldn't I, – I couldn't fraternize with the opponent. I mean, that was just – no the tummy sticks. We call it tummy sticks on the <laughs> podcast. But uh, and now I can't tell you how Rick talking to dear friend Baruby, such respect for these guys. And man, it, it, it's it's amazing. And, and come full circle, and I'm sure you've seen a lot of biz guys you battled through your career with that you you thought you hated, and then you know they're just a lot like you, and they have the same desire to win, same desire to compete uh, as you do, and and you become good friends and. And so my, that first training camp was physical, was nasty. And in fact, I, st I had a great camp and we weren't very good. So I thought I was going to get a good opportunity to play in the National Hockey League by being drafted by a team that wasn't very good. You know, circumstances, everything. I, I, like I said, I, I believed I was one of the better defensemen in camp. And, and I say that humbly, but we just weren't good. And so they didn't want to send me down, but they didn't want to play an 18-year-old. So they had me up for the entire month living in a hotel but not getting in a regular season game played every exhibition game nhl paycheck pretty well nhl paycheck Ooh. for the first month yeah and what, what was it back then biz my first kind maybe 80 grand but i felt it was wow. a billion yeah. oh, for sure. <laughs> this is 1982 <laughs> and the signing bonus she got too was like a billion dollars but and they were sending me down and, and i was like so disappointed i'm going they go kenny we just I go, I go, are you kidding me? I, I, I'm ready. You know, I, I believed in myself. I was one of those guys. So they were sending me down, and Tom McVee tells a story. One of the my great coaches who was a hard ass on me. I thought he hated me. <laughs> but uh, he told the story in the Star Ledger back in 2006 when they retired my number. And he goes, I've never seen a kid like this Danico guy. He goes, and it wasn't about arrogance. He stood up on the board when we were sending him down. There was guys in the organization because they had pins of every player's name and all the defense. Yeah, they the have the depth, the depth chart. The depth chart and pins. 
I stood up and looked at their board and I go, you got to be freaking kidding me. I'm the best defenseman you got. Like, and he told that. He did, told him the legend. He says, I've never seen it. And he says, I, and I was not saying it. I believe I, I wanted to play so bad. I was ready because physically I was ready. You know, some guys are timid coming into camp and no, yeah. I want to go back to junior. You know, this is a little overwhelming. No, I wanted to play now. I was ready. And they kept me for a month, like I said. And Tom, we laugh about it now. Me and Tom still talk about the story. He's still scouting for the Bruins at 80 years yeah, old yeah, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I'll, we'll go on in some stories with him. But he, he loved it, and he tells it. And also, you know, I, I just believed in myself. I wanted to play. Now, I knew where my skill level was at, but we all come out of junior, have some offensive ability. and But I was just wanted to play that bad. And, so they all kind of, I see them collectively thinking, they're, they're, they huddle around, they're going, they look at me, they go, okay, let us think about this. Like, they couldn't believe I was telling them I'm I'm ready to play and I'm, I, I'm the best defenseman you got right now, so what the hell are you doing? <laughs> yeah. But it was all because of me just wanting to be part of it and play now and not, like I said, because I believed it or anything. But you had to believe in yourself. If you didn't. Yeah. Yeah, well, you're not going to accomplish anything. And and looking back, it was probably the, the wise decision. You went yeah. back and developed a little bit more. Everything and it, does. And then I come pl- – absolutely. You look at the steps and as angry as I was back then, and, and I, I got angrier because, as we know, you go through some adversity along the way. So as a 19-year-old, I come back to training camp. Now I'm ready to rock and roll. If I don't make the team – now there's a problem. <laughs> I'm dying to play. I feel like I'm 28 and a 10 year veteran because I I already had that experience of that first training camp. So sure enough, 19 years old, pretty good camp. I'm in the starting lineup, October 6th, I believe it was, or October 3rd, excuse me, 1983. In all of all places, the uh, high, Madison Square Garden, most famous arena in the world, <laughs> sports arena in the world, right? So what a thrill, you know. Obviously, I'm going to play my first game. Nervous as all hell, obviously. My mother and father fly to New York and they fly to Jersey, go to the game. My mother didn't, you know, hates to travel, didn't like big cities, you know. And she's an old school, was an old school lady. And she goes, I have to go to this game because this damn kid told me a thousand <laughs> times he's going to play in Ash Hockey. He's really going to play a damn game. I just, she's beside herself. My brother comes, my older brother, who I looked up to so much, five years older than me. They all, and come to the game, they're at Madison Square Garden. They're like, they think it's a, a zoo like atmosphere, you know, because it's just all these people and screaming and yelling. They didn't know what to expect, but it was overwhelming for them too. But their son's going to play in the National Hockey League. I pl- play that night. I think we get spanked 7 3, if I'm not mistaken. Picked up my first point and assist on a goal. Played my first game, had it, you know, more, didn't have a scrap, but had a little tussle. And my mother, I'll never forget it. Gloves are still on. And it was just a big, you know, those scrums around the net. My mother covers her eyes, goes to my brother. He's not fighting, is he? I can't. See. My brother goes, Oh, he's going to have to do quite a bit of this tomorrow. <laughs> 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 he's going to stare. Hey, I, I heard this a, is going to be his life. <laughs> yeah. So my mother covered her eyes and she goes to him, Is she, and this is not a word of a lie again. You, you love these stories with your mothers. She goes, Is he on top? <laughs> <laughs> is he at least on top? Like in yeah. this at the melee, end. At the, <laughs> I, I actually uh, read a story that you, you tightened your skates too tight because you were so nervous. Yes. Oh, you got. Some one of my former teammates because they they remember more than me. You're absolutely right. My feet were going to fall off. I was you were too jacked up. Too ripping jacked the wheels up. Off. I, I don't know who told you that, Biz, but you're absolutely right. Might have been God. Who Gomer probably because he probably heard it from somebody. <laughs> but a true story. Yeah, like blood Just, circulation was cut off really and had to adjust that obviously but like Kenny just like, loosen your skates like, like it's like I couldn't move out there but I, you're trying to just absorb it all absorb it all I was overwhelmed it was great I'm playing great things are going well in my first 10 11 games 11th game Ed Hospital I remember Ed Hospital we're in Hartford I think we're one and nine at the time going into my 11th game but I'm playing well things are going well I'm getting the experience I'm, I want to be just part of this team and be part of the solution of turning things around one day sure enough another big scrum hospital kind of jumps me from behind I still don't think if he knows that but jumping from behind it's kind of a five on five I fall awkwardly at the time break leg gets stuck break my fibula oh no I'm like oh my god and excruciating pain I'll never forget this. Mel Bridgman was on our team. Remember Mel Bridgman, the great yep. flyer captain and tough as nails. 
well, this is how different the game was back then. So Hospital skates by the bench. I'm I'm lying in agony on the ice by the net. He throws his stick at him like a javelin. <laughs> no penalty, nothing. It was all good. Like he was so p- pissed because he saw what transpired, and Hospital kind of got the jump on me to say the least, and didn't give me a chance. And I fell awkwardly, just awkward because the skate didn't go forward, break my fibula, devastated, cast up to my up to my thigh for three months staying in jersey hanging but you know it's devastating young kid you get on the injury list right away i'm like oh man so eventually march rolls around teams far out of the playoffs so they you know i'm ready to play again it, it was about four month uh, period with the cast they're going to send me back to junior but seattle wasn't as good as Kamloops at the time seattle said no well the team asked him we want to trade him somewhere good so he goes far in the playoffs we needed him to get games in because I was only going to play about 18 more games in junior. And then the playoffs, well, they traded me to Kamloops. Teammates, Dean Everson was our captain. Daryl Ray was the goaltender. Doug Bodger was on defense. Rudy Postcheck was our young enforcer. We had all kinds of guys that, you know, had uh, had played in the National Hockey League, and it was a great team, enjoyed it. The uh, coach was Bill LaForge. He liked the physical aspect. Well, anyway, played me a ton. We went to the Memorial Cup, won the Western Hockey League, lost the Memorial Cup, lost to Ottawa. But um, long story short, so I had 34 points in 19 games when I went down to junior in that span. So <laughs> 34 points. I mean, I'm lighting up. Had a seven-point night against the Victoria Cougars Oof. in a 10-7 win. So <laughs> I'm thinking I'm Bobby Orr, you know. So, <laughs> so you forget kind of. But you can't quite do that in the National Hockey no. League. And this will lead to... You got a little money in your pocket at this point? Well, you just, made, I made some signing bonus. Yeah, I made nice. signing bonus. My first car was a Starsky and Hutch car. Exactly the Starsky nice. and Hutch car. Thought I was the coolest kid ever. Had the white stripe, and the stripe on the side. But just nice. glad I'm back to playing hockey. Yeah. So the next year, think I'm definitely going to make the Devils. No problem. You know, coming to camp. Didn't have a particularly great camp, but... Still thought I'm going to make the team. Sure enough, I get sent down to the minors. I am I'm ready to pack up. I'm, I'm devastated, you know, because I already had that experience. Think I'm ready to play. Team's not very good again. Sent me to Portland, Maine. Loved it there. Played for the Maine Mariners. We had the Flyer colors because we just transitioned from from the Flyers being their affiliate to the Devils. So I still I had wearing Flyer colors my first year with the Portland uh, or with the Maine Mariners at the time. But I was disgruntled. I wasn't happy to be there. You know, a young kid, uh, that's the adversity we're talking about. And, you know, just not playing very well down there. Tom McVee's the coach. He's, you know, just on me all the time. He says, you want to play in the frickin' National Hockey League? I mean, you're closer to Indianapolis, the International League. You know, he goes, Indianapolis is here. Jersey's here in Maine, or Maine's here and Jersey's here. Well, you're closer to going that way. That's when there was three league. You know, the International League at the time was a little it was, lower. It was the coast. It was the co- yeah, East Coast League, exactly. And he was just on me. And so I'm now I'm upset. I'm crazy. I used to walk by his office, go, Tom, anybody call for me? I'd dead serious. He goes, Ken. then every t- once in a while I'd call back. You know coaches were crazy back then. And he'd he go, hey, Kenny, come here. And he goes, guess who called for you? And I'm all excited. He goes, not a freaking soul. Like, <laughs> like there was just no. <laughs> That's, he'd do that's stuff like gutless. that. Yeah, to, Some kid be crying now. He, 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 he'd be, yeah. yeah. Oh, you Call know, his agent. Tease yeah. you, but, and I'd be pissed. But then I, I realized, you know, Tom, I thought he hated me, and I didn't think he played. He was on me because he knew I had potential to be a National Hockey League player or a regular. Yep. But I had to take those steps, you know. And so now I started to focus. Now things got a little better, but still no call up. And sometimes it's contracts. Sometimes there's a lot of different circumstances because 50 grand back then – Wit and Biz was a big difference to oh, the yeah. organizations. And you're here now, and when you understand what transpired. So did I think I deserved to get called up a little earlier? Probably. But it wasn't happening, but I had to take those steps. Under- so I don't get called up all year. I'm, again, really down, down on myself, down and am I that good? Am I ever going to play? They call me up the last game of the year that year against the Philadelphia Flyers. Just a fight. Yeah, so I'm going, really, guys? But I'm pumped. I want to play. And and I remember what I said about getting noticed. So I, I'll never forget. Rich Preston, I think, was Bridgman on the team then? He might have been gone by then. But there was a few of the older veterans going, this is their last game. They come up to me right away and go, 
I remember Rich Preston in particular, and he'll tell the story. All these guys probably tell it better than I do, but he goes, Kenny, we don't need any, you know, disruption here. You don't need to start. We are, are, we're, we're, we're hitting the links. We're having a vacation. We're going to have a nice big team party afterwards. Season's so let's over. not ruffle feathers. The Flyers. They got their trips booked to Cabo. Yeah, Everybody's yeah, yeah, ready they, to go. They've got a, a lot of nasty guys in that team, you know, and I go – I go. I looked Rich in the eye, and he says he loved, and that's what they ended up really respecting and loving about me because that's how bad I want to play. I said, if you don't think I'm getting noticed tonight, you got another thing coming. Good for you. I don't care if I get my head kicked in, I will get noticed tonight. And they're like, going, oh no, because oh, that just means okay. they're they're, oh, they're going to no, be involved fact, yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so where if I so had to be five shifts, and I play a little bit for a while. So I I take a leaping run at Lindsey Carson, who was a player at the time. Five minute elbow, I get big brawl and Zeus <laughs> talks in, involved in there. A young Rick Tockett, he kind of jumps me. Everybody's jumping at me. I get a double major. <laughs> I double got major. noticed. I got noticed. Sure enough, out of the game, and all our guys come in with ice bags. Flyers proceeded to go on down their lineup and kick the crap out of everybody. You know, <laughs> and it goes something like that. And these guys are going, You. A hole, what did you just do? You know, like I said, I was getting noticed, and I'm bruised and bloody too. Because, and the whole nine yards, but sure enough, get noticed. And I wanted to make sure. Well, the following year, again, I'm going, What is going on? They send me down again. I'm like, Oh my god, now I'm asked. One of those guys should ask for a trade, should I? But I love this team that gave me my ch- chance. Stick it out again, go do it. You know, working hard. Down the minors, not happy again. Now Tommy's saying, Kenny, bye. he's being a little nice, saying, bide your time, man. You just don't lose your focus here. Play to your best of your ability. You know, I'm hoping you get your opportunity. You know, they don't know what's going to transpire. He only can send his recommendation. He knew how bad I wanted to play in the National Hockey League and for the Devils, the team to drive me. Well, it's right around December comes along. I'm out with the boys. Portland, Maine. Uh... Great place having lobster, a few beers, you know, because lobster was so cheap oh, yeah. there. And I, <laughs> That's, yeah. Good spot. It's got to be midnight. Steve Tazura was our captain, family man, had a couple of kids. I'm 21 at the time now. Drives to the, the restaurant bar we were at and says, Kenny, here's a quarter. Call Tommy. I'm going, yeah, yeah, screw you. Everybody's because everybody knew how bad I went. But I'm, I, I'm thinking this is another. They're getting me. Uh, I, I, they're getting me. Another. Pulling the wool over my eyes, he goes, Kenny, do you think I'd get out of bed? I, I, I go, yeah, now I think about it. I got two kids at home and a wife. I wouldn't be here. Go call Tommy. I put the quarter in, call Tommy. Hey, Tommy. You know, he's got a deeper, gruffer voice than I do. <laughs> get your ass out of the bar. <laughs> I'll be picking you up at your house at 6 a.m. You got the call up. I'm like, goosebumps. I get goosebumps now thinking about it. I, let's go. And I, let's go. I'm getting called up. Tommy McVee was the... One of the rare coaches, don't know if anybody else, that always picked his guys up himself and took them to the That's airport. pretty cool. Said he took about 500 guys in his career. Jeez. Again, in the paper in 2006, wrote the story about me. So I was unique in one way. So I get the call up. I have eight bags, everything but the kitchen sink packed from my little apartment. I ain't coming back. Is it, well, it, that's where we're going with this. So he, <laughs> he looks at me, sour taste on his face. He goes... What the heck is this? What's all this crap? I go, well, how long am I going for? He goes, how should I know? You play good, you'll be there 15 years. You play bad, I'll see you tomorrow. I'm good. <laughs> so I go, well, and Tommy goes, most guys just have a suit bag, you know, you know <laughs> over their shoulder. What is this? And he, he says, tells a story later. He threw it all in the cab, doesn't say anything to me. Or in his car, shall I say, not the cab, in, in, in his car and lets me take everything. He goes, that was the only guy I let take everything. He says, he was too determined. He was not, and, and, and I looked him in the eye, shook his hand, and I said, Tommy, I'm not coming back, by the way. You know that. And you never Tommy did. never came back. Tommy goes, I knew he wasn't coming back. If there was a kid that wanted it more than him, I hadn't seen him. He says, five, he's the only kid that had every bag packed out of 500 players I've, I've picked up at the time, and 
And, and, and Tommy loved it, too. And I thought he hated me. thought he was hard on me. Well, never went back. And 1,283 games, I humbly say later. And 175 more in the playoffs. So the, you know, I was, and, and I was not going to get injured too much anymore either because I, I had to establish myself and, and went through some lean years with the Devils. And uh, we weren't good. But I, I always wanted to be that guy in, under, in my role, whatever it took. I know who I was. I know I wasn't as gifted and skilled as other guys, but I was going to be part of that team and make a difference and be and and be part of a championship team. And that was another thing. Mark Messier, I grew up with him. I was he was a mentor of mine. I loved the guy. I he walked he was I revered him. And and he always believed in me too. And I trained with him in off season. He's five years older than me, but no I knew way. him. Yeah, yeah, I knew, knew him. When you moved out west, you just what, you you were in the same hometown, Edmonton, Edmonton, Edmonton boy. boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you just started hanging out. So I, I went to his hockey school. So he so was he like, knew me since thirteen years old. Always loved me as a kid. He was your idol, kind he of. He was part, my right? idol, and he was only like seventeen, eighteen at the time. But the Messier Hockey School was huge back in Edmonton. So I was around them, like always around Mark, and just seeing the leadership and see he just had yeah. a presence about him, the aura. And and Mark always believed in me too, and so, you know he just. Love, love my passion, my craziness. I was a little bit off the wall. And so they were starting to win cups. And I'm just starting to establish myself as an 18, 19 year old. Played a little bit like as a 19 year old. And they were starting to win their, go on their dynasty run. And I was out with the parties with them. Mark would always want me to drink from the cup, the old superstition. And come on, can't let's have a picture and drink from the cup. And I said, no, Mark, I can't do that. I'm going to win that on my own. You know, he chuckled because we were winning 17 games a year, I think, at the, <laughs> <laughs> at the time. Yeah. So I'm going to win it on my own. You know what I mean? And so I was one of those kids saying, well, no way I could touch it now because, you know, I, I got to win it. And lo and behold, you know, and I tried, then be, when I became an adult, traveled with Mark all over Europe and his brother Paul who were big mentors of mine they were and Kevin Lowe I used to train with them and I just had such respect for them and I was always around winners around guys that just that had the it factor knew what it took yeah you need talent you need skill as a team but those guys I just love being around them I just soaked it up I absorbed it and like I said traveled the world had a hell of a time too and a lot of fun with them you know, partying. And what do you mean in the off season? You guys are going trips everywhere. to Europe. I went everywhere. I went to Greece really? with them. We planned on going for two weeks. Stayed for five. That's our <laughs> mentality. You know, we because it was too much fun and cheap. You know, <laughs> and did a lot of crazy stuff and all those. I'm sure there were no ladies. Around. Good things. <laughs> <laughs> we were crazy. It was fun. But just being around, I, I use that as an example. Like just being around Mark when he was 23 years old at the time. I think we were in Greece and I was like 18, 19. I watched, nobody knew hockey, but I watched, when he walked into a wrestling bar, he just had that presence. Oh, he yeah. yeah. Kind of like the Mario Lemieux the, presence the, where yeah, you walk Mar in, you everybody. Just know everybody like, that yeah. guy's somebody. Even yeah. if you don't know hockey, you know, you know <laughs> yeah. that guy's somebody. He's yeah. somebody, yeah. you know. And that's leadership. That's You don't teach that. So, you know, he'd send me notes when he was with you others, him and Kevin Loeb, goofy notes before the game because we'd only play once a year at yeah. the time or twice a year. And we weren't good, like I said, so it, it was fun in games. And I'd compete when we played against them, but they were just, you know, really glad that I was getting my opportunity. Then in 92, I'd already played, oh, you know, eight, nine years, and Mark Messier gets traded to the New York Rangers. And go, oh, man, this is our biggest rival. Hate it. We didn't talk for two years. Yeah. We drilled each other in the face. We wouldn't – we laugh about it on the golf course now every once in a while, but – when I ever get to get out there with him, but it was just that intense. In instantly, you're like, I just can't Instant, associate yeah, with yeah, this well, guy. He, him too. I mean, here I am. I got to stop one of the greatest players, and if I don't whack and hack him, and Mark was strong as ten men, yeah, he's gonna hack you right back. Yeah, too. Mark. You know, he's so gonna, even I'll in the off crazy. season, you wouldn't. You no, wouldn't we couldn't even really. You know, once in a while, uh, I, I shouldn't say we didn't hang, but we hello and laugh a little bit. But then the season came and it just stopped again. So. Going to an incident that, again, we're, we're going all over, but this is about my devil's career and about influences in my life. And, and Mark was certainly a big one, but God, I hated that he was a New York Ranger. Oh, I <laughs> and we had the epic series and lost to him in 92 in seven games. They were the better team. 94 epic series, one oh, of the greatest playoff series ever, and I was so proud to be part of that. It was disappointing. We lost, and that was our kind of progression. Oh. We won the cup the following year in 95. What were you guys saying in the locker room when they when they guaranteed the victory? Yeah, Mark always tells the story. People, you know, he always says, look, I was just taking trick. the pressure off guys. Yeah, he put his money where his mouth is. One of the greats of all time. If I reflect now, I was, you know, I was 
you're angry, you're pissed, but Mark believed it, you know. And the thing was, we we had them down two nothing in that game too, and you know we we didn't know how to close the deal. Nerves. That's all about. We talk about learning how to win, yep. learning to go that step further. Have them down three two. Have them down two nothing in game six. Dominating for thirty minutes should have been five nothing. Mike Richter, who never gets enough credit, he no. was as good a goaltender as I've ever seen. Stood in his head until the Mark Messier show took over, and second half of the game, they came back with a late goal in second, and then they started to roll, and we were tight as a drum, couldn't hang on to the puck. Rangers had a lot of Stanley Cup winners on yeah. their team. The Kevin Lowe's, the McTavish's, the Mark Messier's. Glenn Anderson was Glenn on Glenn Anderson. Team. They knew what Teaking it took in. to win and, and to come back from a deficit like that. So I, if I look back now, I'm going, what a missed opportunity. No, that was all us. We talk about it today in today's game, the experience, what experience means. That won you next year. We were year. that close. Now we go to game seven and we tie it up with seven seconds left. We think we're a team of destiny. End up losing double overtime. Epic series. But point being, it was their time. Those are veteran guys that had won cups and knew it. And now a word from our friends at TaylorMade. You've heard us talk about them. You've seen Wit and Biz compete with some of the best in the world using them. And now you can get your hands on them. The TaylorMade Sim family has hit stores and are available now. But what good are some of the best clubs in the world without a great, without a great golf ball? Well, the tour response is for those people who have always wondered what those high-priced tour balls are and you're afraid to pull the trigger. Well, these are for you. And if you want something that is tour ready, check out the TP5 and TP5X. And brand new, you can even get TaylorMade's TP5 balls branded with the iconic Spit and Chicklets logo right on the side. And you can find them in the Barstool Sports Store right now. Visit BarstoolSports.com slash TaylorMade to check out TaylorMade and all the Barstool golf gear, including all that Chicklets line of stuff. So give it a whirl if you haven't yet. And now we're going to send it back to Ken Danico. Ironically or not ironically, we win the Stanley Cup the next year. Didn't have a great regular season. We were able to turn the switch on. It was a short year. Once the playoffs came, we, we'd already had that taste. We knew what it took. We knew how to close the deal. We knew how to take it, the cliche term, t- game at a time, period of time. Don't get too high, high when you're winning a series or losing a series or winning a game or you lose a tough one. We didn't know how to handle it that year. And it was a minuscule. But- Marge Fair was very minuscule. Knew how to handle it the following season. But Messier was so influential, even though I didn't like him that much in 94. When they, they went on to beat the Vancouver Canucks in the Stanley Cup. But all Game part seven, of our story. Right but you asked our yeah. interaction. Go ahead. You. No, I was just going to ask about 95 the next year because, yeah, you guys were ready and had been through the prior season. But Detroit was enormous favorites in that series, right? You guys swept them. Kind of like Tampa Bay, Montreal right now. I mean, Tampa Bay's an enormous favorite going in. I couldn't understand how we were that. None of us really could understand how we were that big underdogs. Yeah. Because the previous year, but everybody goes, what have you done for us lately? I think we were fifth seed, okay. sauntered into the playoffs. They won the President's Trophy they, right by that a, year. By a mile. <laughs> it was only a 48-game season, I think, because right. it was the lockout prior. But how soon people forgot that we had 106 points the year before, second of the New York Rangers. We came very close to going to the Stanley Cup final and probably winning it for all intents and purposes if we got by New York. So we were 1-2 in the National Hockey League the previous year. We had the same team and even added a few pieces, Neil Broughton, and even got better. And uh, um, so we couldn't understand, but going into the series, because we sauntered in. They were looking at what we did there in the regular season. We didn't do much, but we do get to the finals. And we were down a couple series early on. So Jacques Lemaire, you learn from greats and Larry Robinson who have enough don't have enough hands for the rings on their fingers, whether it's players or 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 in management or, or executives or coaches. And just that's why Lou Lamorello brought them in. And Lou Lamorello was the man with the instrumental reason why and, and the, the architect of why our team ever turned the corner. Uh, I mean, we could talk about were you. Were hours. you intimidated by him? All right, I'll give you some good loose stories. Don't worry. We got – you guys got about four hours. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this would be a trilogy. No, but no, so – Talking about 95, and I just want to throw in Lou there because he was just knew what it took. But his first thing was his recognition to bring in Lemaire and Robinson. That was, now we're going to understand. We can't listen to these guys to get to that next step because we'd already started you, getting to be You had been through a lot of coaches before. Yeah, before Jacques, started right? yeah. to make the playoffs, started to knock on the door, you know, before Jacques a little bit. But, you know, couldn't, you went around, lose in the first round a lot. But Lou knew, knew we needed... 
uh, something else to get to the next step. So 95 comes and getting to that finals where we were complete underdogs to the Red Wings. Probably two and a half to one, Wit. I don't know exactly what the No, was yeah. Like, it was... But it was a big dog because they were dominant. They had the great Eisenman and Fedorov, and those guys were unbelievable. And Paul Coffey was on that team. And I can go on down the list. I'm trying to think of all the star quality players they had, but there was plenty of them. And the hit, the hit heard around the world that they, series. Yeah, the Steve, so Jacques Lemaire genius you know we talk about these vince lombardi type speeches newt rockney once in a while and they always get blown out of proportion but it wasn't so much a speech as jacques lemaire and his french accent lines up the board he wanted to make sure we weren't reading the press clippings he knew we had great veteran leadership in the room and stevens and you know we had neil broughton we had randy mckay myself we just had a little bit just a great mix a young bill gear and uh, you know brian rolls we just had a nice mixture of so many good players, uh, Bobby Holik, and, and just a real good mix of guys that knew what it took. That w- He believed we weren't going to think we were overwhelmed here. Because if you think you're beat, defeated, even though you can say with the words, oh, no, we got a chance. But if you don't believe it deep inside that you can beat the mighty Detroit Red Wings, you're, you're lying. Just like Montreal played a much better game yesterday. I mean, mm-hmm. played great, in fact, and dominated. Didn't find a way to win yet. But they were a different team. They, they were overwhelmed in game one. So Lamara looks at the board, and he put, lined up every player on both sides. And he did comparables, whether it was – he says, Deno, he put me to one, up against one of the Detroit defense. I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure you're as good as him and maybe can even outplay him. Do, what do you think? Then we're looking at it, and then he goes, Rich, Stefan Richet in his French accent. My French accent's going to go, can you outplay that guy? <laughs> can you outplay – yeah, they got some pretty good players, and you know, they got some star players in Iserman and Fedorov, but – I kind of think we're better on defense, and I sort of think we're better in goal. You know, and Lemaire's making sure that we aren't defeated before we start this series because you read the play scriptums enough and say, God, we don't have a chance. Do you yeah, you, know, yeah, you yeah. start to believe that a little, or it creeps in your mind. But when Jacques did that, it was genius because we're looking at the lineup going, holy crikeys, we're, we're pretty comparable. In fact, we might even be better in some areas. Yeah, they might have a few more, a little bit more star power up front in a couple of guys, but overall, and then the rest is history. And no, do we think we'd sweep them? Absolutely not. But we win game one and beat them both times. And and then we dominated them at home where we won decisive games. And I know the great Scotty Bowman said we had no answer. He, he said it was the most frustrated he's been in his illustrious coaching career, his Hall of Fame career, that says I'd never seen a team – that was all over us. We had no answer for anything against them, you yeah. know. And obviously, we were a stifling team. I don't want to use trap because I hate that word because I never heard it in our room. That was a manufactured name by yeah. the media. We were great in the neutral zone, and it was because the trap to me is sitting back. We were one of the top scoring teams every year. But if you look it up, people don't add that. We were ninety four. We were, and this is the Jacques Lemaire era. We were one of the top scoring. I think we were second in the league in goals. Two thousand. Jacques wasn't even there. We were second in the National Hockey League goals. And by the way, we lost the cup in two thousand one. We were number one in the regular season in goals for. But we, God forbid we didn't have a fifty goal score. No, yeah. we had a lot of guys that scored twenty and thirty. And we were very responsible defensively and had a great goaltender. And you see, the more the game changes, the more it stays in. I love the new game. I love the skill, the talent, the little cross goals, the toe drags. These kids are amazing. But come playoff time, word is revert to. Defense win championships. Look at the Tampa Bay Lightning. They can win any way. And until they adjusted, until they added some of that grit, yeah. they're, they're frustrating defensively. But yep. our teams could score. People... Always, I, I get offended because I it takes away how great our forwards were. They were yeah. just so damn responsible and great on back pressure. We cut the ice in half, and yeah, we had a good defense, and yeah, we had a great goaltender. But it wasn't that we we counterattacked very well, but we were always a top offensive team in the league. If you don't like the style, it's okay. But that's what goes on today's game. It's no different. Yeah. It's yeah, results speak for themselves. After Tampa Bay lost to Columbus four straight, what did they do? They adjusted. They can win. Just as easy, one nothing now. And no, they have to sometimes. And and that's how good they are. And they have an all-world goaltender. But that was a big part of uh, our lesson in having Jock Lemaire and Robinson. These guys are just – you look at them and you go, they they just – you had such respect for them. But that was a real good – I'm not going to say speech, but a good thing a couple days before that Jock made sure we understood we could beat them. All right, what was the the, the question you were going to have for him about uh, Scott Stevens, how he came over? How Yeah, well, Shanahan signed the free agent deal at St. Louis, and you guys were just awarded Scott Stevens after that. What what was that all about? I know it was a long time ago. Well, genius by Lou Lamorello, right? I mean, obviously – 
And they had offered two pretty damn good players, Rod Brindamore and Curtis Joseph, the goaltender, I believe. And, you know, I don't don't know the business aspect back then. We're just players and everything. But obviously it was tampering. St. Louis had slyly offered Brendan Shanahan this outrageous four-year contract. Um, was he restricted or something? I don't even yeah, know. Yeah, I figured back the, the rules so, back then. So, yeah, so, like like a, the so basically like long. an offer sheet kind of before yeah, they were offer sheets? Yes, exactly. And how they were going to get him, but it was against the league rules, whatever that was. So it goes to arbitration court, and they're offering Joseph and Brendan Moore. I mean, are you kidding me? That's pretty awesome players. Shanahan was a going to be a heck of a player, second overall pick, but he hadn't quite established himself, but he was getting there. You could see he was going to be an elite player. Scoring 30 goals, power forward, tough as nails. And Lou Lamarello shoot, shot for the star. He says, no, we want Scott Stevens. Somehow, some way, the St. Louis or the arbitrator awarded us Scott Stevens. Wow. And yeah. Scotty just knew. Lou knew. Lou, Lou knew. So he shot for the fences. I think he would have been pretty content getting Curtis Joseph and Rod Brindamore yeah, right. at the time. Yeah, it was and a I win-win those win at that two point. Guys. Again, don't quote me, but I'm almost positive that was the, the deal initially that they were trying to, to – Give us some two great players in their own right, obviously, right? So we got Stevens. The rest of history. Now we had, you know, that big, tough defenseman on the back end. You know, Scott was drafted my year. He was fifth overall, I believe, in my year. And I played a lot against him in Washington. Couldn't stand him either. But uh, I, I, I always wanted to be the – I always use that term, the poor man Scott Stevens. I'm going to be the poor man Scott Stevens. Not as good offensively, but that tough, nasty, big hitter. Uh, but, you know, just – that was I'd be happy with that, you know. But when we got him, I was certainly going, can't believe this guy's on our team now. Like now we're starting to become formidable. Now we got Scott Stevens. Now we've got uh, a real good nucleus of guys up front, and then we get to draft Scott Niedemeyer, the still underrated to me, the best, most effortless skater I've ever seen in the game. Yeah. The game has ever seen. I love that kid. He's just awesome. He was 19 years when he was 19 years old, and I was 30, and still a little bit of a wild man uh, throughout my career. I'm going. When I grow up, I want to be Scott. I don't word of a lie. We're still real close, and <laughs> such respect for him, just because of the way he carried himself and the way he handled his life, and on and off the ice. And, and and as far as a player, I still think he doesn't get enough recognition. I still don't think. I know he's in the hall. He's so under the radar. He's so such a, the, he's a quiet he's guy. Sacrificed, he sacrificed. He's a quiet guy, but just so well thought out. Such an intelligent guy. And but had that burning desire to win. It just the game looked easy to him, so sometimes it didn't look like he was trying. I never seen a guy who want to win like Niedemeyer. He just did it in a different fashion. Witt said he played with him in Anaheim, and he, he, he played sweat. thirty oh, minutes, and he'd have a one bead of sweat yeah. on his chest. Yeah. We, no, but he was also a competitor. Yeah, yeah. You know, He he would get angry well, out look, there and look no further than he got a ten game suspension. I never had a ten game suspension. I never had a suspension in National Hockey. Neither cracked Peter Worrell over the head with his stick. Got ten games for it. No way. Because yeah. he, he had enough is enough. He kept getting. Remember he took that slap out. shot at Alfredson yeah. too in the Cup <laughs> yeah. Finals. He, so, dude, he was a snap. Believe shot. me, he had that little yeah. screw. So I'm going needs. What he clubbed Peter Worrell, one of the toughest guys in National Hockey, over the head with his stick, <laughs> and got ten games for it. So. Needs had that competitive spirit yeah. as you, you don't win four cups. You don't win everywhere you go. And wherever he goes, they happen to win. Yes, because he's highly skilled, but he has that that heart, that yes. that will and, and character. I, I love him. And you're right. We were like, we roomed together at times. We were like Oscar and Felix. <laughs> but <laughs> but he's a guy, he's one of the guys, you know, you, you not many guys, you because everybody goes, has their own lives and you move on. You try to stay in touch. You always have a special bond. You, Five guys in the on those Devils teams won all three cups together. Don't matter if you don't see each other for ten years; it's like you never left. Who were the five that won? Won all? Niedermeyer, Stevens, Brodeur, myself. Uh, it's Sergey Brillian. Did I name five? Nieder, Stevens, me, Broder, Brillian. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes people, Sergey Brillian, another guy, maybe doesn't. <clears throat> you know, there's always the unsung heroes. He was kind of the Swiss Army knife, could do it all. Yeah. But he was one of those guys you had to have to win. And he, he was the other guy that won all three. So anytime I see Sarge, he's still working. So we call Sergey Breland. See him in there. He works in the organization. It's, it's like you, you, you have that special that blow, bond, blow yeah. about you, that bond. It's like, yeah, we won three times together. Yeah, <laughs> so you cool. feel it. You don't have to say it. You know what I, I mean? Because it. Nope. it means something. And and uh, But when we got Stevens, and then we got Niedemeyer, and then we got Brodeur, I'm like, oh, man, now we got that all-world goaltender. Even though you just saw it, even though he had an established subject, you saw the second year, yeah, this Broder kid's going to be pretty good because he had a quiet confidence about him that you had to have in the net. And and the rest is history. We won those three times, and, and 
we always had a chance. You're not going to win every year, but we knew we had the nucleus and core. And, and you don't, they don't stay together that long. We had five guys that were together 10 years pretty well. Just doesn't happen too often. You know? and, uh, and three of them are defensemen and a goaltender. So the chemistry you're able to – and the bond and just on and off the ice – it becomes an important factor of why we were so consistent defensively and in our zone. And I mean, and Marty was like a third defenseman. I could peel off, not get my face run into the boards. I knew the pass would be right on my stick better mm -hmm. than any defenseman or the pass that I could give. You know, <laughs> it, so it just all those elements helped so much along the way that uh, pretty amazing. Yeah, from a team that couldn't win 20 games to still being around because you usually get traded when you become good and Lou had many reasons off the ice to trade me many yeah. times but that's what I loved about Lou Lamar. Dano this is unreal we don't want to keep you all day though but we need to hear a couple Lou stories that that, that you've uh, probably yeah, never well, forgot look I said I was grateful to you know play as long as I did with the Devils and been there 38 years and they have treated me like family yeah. Their loyalty has been unbelievable. I don't take that ever for granted because you have different ownership and they appreciate the history and the guys that are, are the foundation of how this organization was built and I have such respect for, for our guys, uh, you know, Josh Harris, David Blitzer, because these guys, I don't take that for granted because yeah. they, they, you know, when you get new ownership, when you go in a different direction. They can you know, decide to clean decide house. clean house. They don't, you don't know what they're going to think of you yeah. or how they respect you and they have given us all the alumni the utmost respect and understand. No, we got to get back there. You know, we got to get back to that mentality and those guys. So, I, I have great respect for the organization and I was grateful I was there because usually you're not. Once the team becomes good, and Lou made, Lou traded some great players to to build the team into a championship. Well, from the Kirk Mullers, who I love, to the Pat Verbeeks, yeah. to I can go on Billy down the Garen. line. I mean, Billy, Billy won Billy, one, Billy but he Garen, traded but he him after. One, yeah. but traded him after, and I love Billy. One of my favorite teammates of all time, by the way. Uh, on and off the ice, just a character. And what a player. But, yeah, you're right. But you have to trade good players to get pieces that you feel fit in moving forward. And, you know, because it never, never stays the same. So... For me to stay there, 88 was our turning turning point. We made the playoffs for the first time. Mm -hmm. Lou Lamorello, no coincidence. That was his first year. Who is this guy out of Providence? I mean, but as soon as Lou came, you know, I think Biz had said earlier to me on the podcast, he goes, were you intimidated ever by Lou? Are you kidding me? We were horrified of Lou right out of the gate as, <laughs> as kids. And, and he had that presence. I talked about it with Messier. He had that it factor. We had no clue who Lou Lamarill yeah. is. He's, what is he? He came out of college. AD yeah. out of Providence College. Yeah, What's that? Like, exactly, you know what I mean? I know. But he came in and we're like, but he had that that presence, like going, oh, don't mess with this guy. You know, just don't were, mess were, with this Were guy. you guys doing the L on the forehead when he would come in the room? Scotty said at one point they would warn each other because he, he showed coming. up out of nowhere, right? Yeah. He'd just be there. So I, guess. I mind my p's and q's I, I, out of the gate anyway. For with Lou, I'm like, yeah, but yes, we had to be warned because everybody, he, we, there, that fear factor. He had that, eyes and ears everywhere. Uh, everywhere too, right? it was like yeah. there were six of them. Yeah. you know what I mean. But even right away at a young age. But but one thing about Lou, you know, about everything's the discipline and you know he he would he was very hard on players. Meaning. He just wanted to win, and he wanted guys that had character. He gave you a lot more leeway than people thought. Like, I raised my hand because I would have been traded 62 times if there, <laughs> if there wasn't a little Lou, Lee with Lou Lamarillo. But I will say humbly, Lou Lamarillo believed he needed Ken Danico to win in his role. But, no, do I need to – Straighten him up a little bit off the ice, his craziness and, and, and the fun he liked to have. Absolutely. But it, Lou took me in one time and said, when I was young and all and my many meetings, when he knew exactly where I was at three in the morning, two nights before, and it was amazing. But the guy knew everything. And yeah. you'd look in his face as a young kid trying to pull the wool over his eyes. I'm sure Gomer told you some of those stories. I loved Gomer because when he came to the team – Took a little pressure off of <laughs> yeah. me because he, he was – now yeah. Gomer was the whipping boy. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, he'd be out till four. You'd get in yeah, at two, yeah, so, so you'd yeah. be the one getting So, uh, all kidding aside, but Lou, he, he would uh, – he knew everything. And I, I'd look him right in the eye and, you know, Kenny, why, where'd that bruise in your head come from? You didn't get in a scrap the other night. Like, you take me in the office. You know, hey, this is like early 90s. And, you know, something happened at a bar the night before or whatever. I go, well, Lou, you won't believe this. Driving my car home, you know, deer all over the road. Bam! Hit the deer, hit my head on yeah. the windshield, and looking and really, 
You're selling it. I'm selling it yeah. good, you know, because Gomer used to. I, Gomer, I'm sure he told you his stories, and he Gomer, I don't think sold it as good as I did because you you could see right through Gomer. I swear I'm doing good. And Lou looks at me he's sitting there very calmly. He goes, "You're so full of," you know. He goes, "I know exactly where you were and what happened." <laughs> and he heard the incident. He goes, "But I heard again for the right reasons. This was about a teammate. I was gotten a little scuffle and protected." And he goes, "Lou might not want me to tell this one, but I'll I'll, I'll, I'll sum it up by saying, he looked me in the eye and he says." You're sticking out for your team. It's don't ever go there again. Yeah. I don't ever want to see, hear that you're in that place again and blah, blah, blah. But I had done something for a teammate. So he heard the whole story because it was bigger than it was, but there was no social media, no internet. TMZ. But he said that there was an officer near there and told him the whole whole story. So no, Kenny doesn't start things. He, yep. fin- got fin- he finishes them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to say that. I didn't look too, yeah. very, too good. But it was all about a, a, a young teammate of mine that got in a little brouhaha and so long story short, that's the type of person Lou was. He's don't you ever go there again and clean your act up and, and, and take care of yourself. And, you know, he'd reprimand you, but he knew he had to leave it because he knew my heart. He knew the game, the team was my everything. But, yeah, I had to juggle wanting to have too much fun. Hey, I, I, I'm a kid from Edmonton, Alberta, Western Canada, the prairies pretty well. Coming to New York City, it chewed me up and spit me out a few times, fellas. But, yeah. but Lou – you know, uh, had did you guys been, ever did you ever give it back to him about anything? Was there ever an argument between you oh, two? Twenty man, years. Man. You ask Lou like he lo- Lou with me. I was very nervous. Was not nervous. Respectful. Respectful early on, but I was a fiery kid. I was yeah. a hot tempered kid. Double it, sort of Lou, Lou liked that. Lou used to take me in and go, Kenny, it's you uh it's a double-edged sword with you he, he goes your biggest asset is your biggest liability and i kind of didn't get that and then i thought about it for a while he goes yeah because he goes you're that switch is always on and you you'll run through a brick wall for us but you run through a brick wall when you shouldn't be running through a brick wall <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> he's like kenny there's a door right there's there door. <laughs> <laughs> you know so i really took that to heart you know and, and as i tried to curb my lifestyle a little bit and, and don't get me wrong i had a blast and we, we can tell a few stories along the way but you know things like that and then he gave me you know i've told this a million times the orchestra story where i wanted to be a little bit of everything coming out of junior i had some offensive ability offensive ability even when lou came i got a little power play time and once in a while so he knew you like a book even his first second year and and i was a penalty killer played when we were up three two a lot all those defensive uh, roles that you have so I wasn't on the power play and that was okay but then they teased me Bruce Driver got injured he I got in the power play for four games second power play unit four points goal and three helpers now I'm told you, know, you guys I told you guys yep young player changing Move over mentality. Niedermeyer they're a bunch Move of second assists too Dano <laughs> so, so, so a bunch of second oh, yeah, I, I like me the, I would have led the league in assists that, Gomer loves telling that story I would have led the league in assists if they had a third well, assist I, I, gotta, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if you still hold this NHL record but you went 255 straight games without oh a I hold it absolutely and this is a guy that out of junior had 34 points in 19 games but that kind of alludes to the story of what I'm saying with Lou so Lou I get four points in four games as a young player on the power play. And I hadn't been playing power play, but now I get teased a little bit. So I'm disgruntled. Lou knew I wear my emotion on my sleeve. And he goes, after practice, he goes, Kenny, come up to my office. Something's bothering you. He knew exactly what was bothering me. So he sits down. I, I, I sit down and he goes, he goes, what's bothering you? He knew like, what, what was coming on my I said, well, Lou. I had some success in the power play, four points in four games, second power play unit, and now I'm not in the power play anymore. And I go, you know, I, I did so, you know, patting myself on the back, I did so good. Then he goes, Kenny, simple, Bruce Driver's back, back, and he's the power play guy. Like, matter of factly, I'm yeah butting him as all young kids do. He goes, sit down. He goes, listen to me. He's very calm, and he knows I'm steaming because I'm like, hey, I'm not very calm with him. I'm intense. Because I'm going, no, I can do it all. I'm I'm good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He goes, I liken my team to an orchestra. He says, in order to make beautiful music, that means six, have team success and win games. Everybody's got to play that their instrument to a T. There's violinists. There's pianists. There's drummers. What category do you think you fall in there? Now he's getting uppity. What category do you think you fall in there? Now, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed at the time. 
but I know where he's going. I'm pretty sure I'm a drummer. So he goes, if you want to be a violinist, he says, I'll call 15 teams right now in front of you and see if they need a violinist. But he says, oh, and by the way, if he says, you're a penalty killer, you kill penalties, you protect teammates, you play physical. And by the way, if you master that drum, you got a chance to play 15 years in this league. If you want to be a violinist, I'm pretty sure your career is going to be short. I'm like taking it back. And Fuck, yeah. So I, I get up. I, I, I throw the chair. Right? Talking about do you ever fight back. And believe it or not, and Lou was ready to jump on the desk. Like he's fearless. He's like a, like a wolverine. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But he loved the little, because he loved that fighting spirit, even though he wouldn't let you show you that. So I'm throwing the chair, yeah, but, and F you, and, you know, all the explicitives. I'm just all fired up. So he calms down. I get up. I throw the chair, ready ready to slam the door. And uh, he goes, that's when he said, I sorry, I, I got ahead of myself. He says, Kenny, by the way, if you master that drum, yeah. I don't care if you ever, you know, score a goal. You have a role on this team, and everybody needs to understand the role. You will play 15 years, because he believed in me. So, thought for a couple of days, I'm angry, I'm burning inside, because you want to be everything. Yep. But understanding, I, I took it to heart. Like I like I said, I wasn't the sharpest knife in the tool in the shed, and when I said earlier about, way earlier in the podcast, that what happened to this great player? How come he had a cup of coffee in the league? Because you can't do what you can do in junior, if you, and you have to find a role in the National Hockey League. Unless you're Scott Niedemar, you can do translate what you did in junior to the pros, to the best league in the world. But I couldn't. So I had to find a role. I had to find a niche. That was the message Lou was saying. And he said, no, I can actually be a big part of this team and a big part of what we're trying to accomplish, and that's winning. And that's he knew how bad I wanted to win, and uh, that, that's all I ever cared about. But – Learning, you know, to understand, I took it to heart and I said, he doesn't care if, I used to joke, he doesn't care if I go over the red line. He doesn't care if I, he, he'd put the dog collar on me and zap me if I had the puck. He doesn't need you to score. Like, I, it, the, the, need, and you did had a role. For 255 and, games. No, <laughs> early on I had five and six goals early I, on. I just, <laughs> no, and I didn't care either. You know what? That, but I didn't have any any worries about that either. I didn't yeah. even know the, you know. And now I, I, I'm kind of, you know, I look at it and go, hey. I got that going for me. I didn't score for two. Yeah. I played 1,203 games, 20 years. You're doing something right, you know. Oh, so yeah. I, and, and I look at it more from the standpoint that exactly what they didn't need that for me. Sure, it was fun once in a while. 2000, I scored it in the Stanley Cup Finals. My only against Stanley Dallas, Cup Finals right? goal in da- at home against Dallas. Yeah, I remember. Gave I us remember. Two-one lead at the time. I remember. And you I jumped celebrate. up. You yes, jumped. I, I thought it was a. 40 foot vertical it was about 17 yeah. inches it was I'd Mickelson never, after he won the Masters I'd, yes I'd never been so excited in my life and it, just to see how the bench gets excited because I always say I'm like a defensive lineman an offensive lineman do they score touchdowns no get to celebrate to, it yes yeah, so, so do you you have to understand your role and I took it to heart and really understood what Lou said so that's why I look at any young kid today and or kids back in my day I, I really reflect and go he was so good, but now I see why he didn't have a long career because he couldn't quite find his niche, couldn't find that role, or didn't want to be they don't put adapt. into the adapt to that role because people don't understand. All of us, Biz, you, I'm sure, Jim, you were scoring in junior a little bit, but you had a role in the yeah. National Hockey. Yeah. I yeah. had my role. So many players yeah. have to be able to trans, you know, absolutely translate to what they're saying, and Lou made sure you understood that. And now a word from our friends at Labatt Blue Light. At Labatt, they don't care if you're good or bad at most things in life. They only care if you're good at beer, being yourself, and not pretending to be someone you're not. And if you are, they're good with you. After all, if you choose Labatt Blue Light, you're good at the most important thing there is, beer. We already know you're good at watching hockey. Be good at beer, too, with pristine Canadian Pilsner Labatt Blue Light. We're going to be working with Labatt, Labatt Blue all year. We have some exciting content coming up, so grab a pack and enjoy the rest of your summer. Again, grab some Labatt Blue Light, enjoy the rest of your summer. And now we're going to go back to Ken Danico. So I love the orchestra story. He still tells it. He tells yeah. me now when I see him uh, every once in a while in the arena or we text each other, he goes, 
Gave one of my Islander kids the Ken Danico speech. Yeah. <laughs> and I, like, I, I love it. Parcel every week. He's like an uncle to me. I have such respect for him because obviously won three cups together. Oh, did we butt heads a lot? No question about yeah. it. But he he loved it. Like, he, he would threaten to trade me constantly, you know, and just to try to curb my appetite for the nightlife. And that was me. I loved life. I loved fans. I loved people. I was out with them. I didn't care. That was what I did. And... Yeah, I drank too much and had too much fun. But Lou Lemerell, of all people, known as the most disciplined, no-nonsense type of general manager, doesn't trade Ken Danico in 20 years. So what does that tell you? But no, he still felt he had something to bring to the table. And Lou has a heart. Yeah, Lou has loyal. character. Loyal as loyal can be. And then that's why he was going to stick with me and, and see it through and... You guys can ask what you want. Obviously, I haven't drank no, August I 9th mean, for 10 years. Yeah, I've so, yeah, <laughs> been sober a long time. I give Lou Lamar a lot of credit. I give... You're coming up on 10 years, Dano? 10 years, August That's 9th. Awesome. That's awesome. That's awesome. I sobriety. can't believe it. And Congrats. I can joke about my... Because I had some blasts in my drinking days. And I'm still crazy, as you guys can see, because I can't shut up. But <laughs> point being, just such respect for the game and Lou that stuck with me because... Loyal. He saw what... I had already done for the organization with the organization because no we're I, now it's about us being there for ken and, and i don't take that for granted because yeah, that's awesome you're a piece of me because mine was public knowledge i went away in 97 i was during the season when i was playing well you know and and that's kind of how it all happened that uh, you know uh, uh 97 lou had been there what 10 11 years now and the owner, John McMullen, who I said I could, the late, great John McMullen, who was like a second father to me, because I was his original pick. I stuck up for the colors early on and get my head beaten in in Philadelphia. Yeah. He saw all that. And he was an old school, you know, general type guy that uh, was like, no, he, he the, I go to war with this guy. I don't care if he makes mistakes. You know what I mean? And so he enabled me to a fault because him and Lou used to battle over it a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but well, 97 rolls along. We're, I'm playing really good hockey and getting in a little trouble, you know, away from them. When we say trouble, meaning wouldn't be public, but it was he, he, stuff. Go, Ooh, I'm, I'm playing with fire now, you know. Mm -hmm. So I go in, God, November. Had a good month, October. I go into Lou and said, Lou, I, I you know, but I, I but I, I did have an awareness, you know, of my cell phone. You know, there's something going on here. I, I've got to, I, I, you know, I, after 95, we won the cup. I, I'd already quietly went away on my own for alcohol treatment. Yeah. Two months after partying my you-know-what off and, and having a great time and having a lot of fun and I can name drop a ton of names for this little Edmonton guy that I was like, starstruck and yeah. hanging out with some pretty cool people and having a great time, you know, and, and it was a blast at the time. But 95, two months in after that, I'm empty. I just won the Stanley Cup. Used to carry a garbage, silver garbage can over my head. That was the second dream about winning, playing in the National Hockey and then winning Cup for all us young kids. Just won the Cup. Two months later, I'm empty. I'm like, there's something wrong with me here. Nick. And duh, well, it's right in front of your face. You drink too much. You have too much for good time. Yeah. There's And I was a guy who burned the candle at both ends because I worked out like a maniac. That's why I was able to maintain. And also, because I look back 20 years and go, how did I get through that at times with off and on benders and partying yeah. and drinking too much? And and people love that about me, by the way, because I was not an obnoxious guy. I was a fun guy. But it was becoming a problem. And, and I always look at 95, and two months in, I'm – I'm devastated. I, I'm, I'm, I'm empty. And that's not right. I'm going, there's something going on. I was pretty astute with what was going on in my life. I'm going, what's wrong with me? Well, duh, you drink too much. But I'm not ready to admit that. Because, yeah, <laughs> right. no, that's going to take away from my fun, my fun, yeah. the great times I'm having. But I said, I'm willing. So I talked to some family members, wanted to keep it away from the team because I'm horrified they're going to look at me as yeah. taboo. Yeah. Oh, so such more of a stigma back then. Stigma, yeah, back taboo. Then was, oh, no, yeah. we can't have them around. You have you know? to drink to be around, right? Like, yeah, it was that yeah, so, thought. Go away quietly on my own. And I was a model citizen or a model student because like, I had an earnest effort. I wasn't trying to just fake it, you know, to go to appease people. I really wanted – this was on my own accord along with some family members talking. Go 95, go full month and get back, come back, play 96. So I, nobody's – or very rarely is there a first-time winner. I hope guys can get it out of the gate. So my story is everybody thinks – when I be went public 97, yeah, everything's great. I've been sober for 102 years, you know, <laughs> ever since. 
but you have to yeah. fall and pick yourself back up again. And I fell a few times, but I had some good brief stints with sobriety that, and the game was so important to me. So I had discipline. I would curb it for three months where I'd be holding my breath, where I wouldn't go out, wouldn't drink, or I'd just drink club soda going out to, you know, to the restaurants. And Must the have been hard though, man. Like Really hard, you know? but 95. So I went about five months of sobriety. Loving it. That was, seemed like an eternity, but I'm hanging on understanding that it's not my time. I'm not ready. And, Started going out again because I I used as a crutch. I'm not I'm not me. I'm not that rambunctious can. It's affecting me on the ice. Yeah, I'm maybe a little feel like I'm a little better shape or whatever. But I was always in great shape regardless because I worked my tail off. Didn't matter. I was that's what Lou says. I don't know how you do it sometimes, but he says I've never seen a guy work harder. And you're burning the candle at both ends at times. And I did, but I had that motor. That motor go go go. So I had some brief stints right then I then now it's all years of juggling. Then 97 or, or a couple of years of juggling, you know, because team came first. I was one of those guys who would never go out night before a game ever. That was my cardinal rule, and I stuck to it. Always did. So it was always a couple nights before, but those benders might be strong, yeah. you know. And I'm <laughs> might as well have been the night before. Me, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, oh, oh, shit, I, we, shit, we I did Friday? have my rules because the team meant too much, the game meant too much, and I, I say that with sincerity. There, I didn't want to screw with that, but now it's taking over. Now, sounds like 97 rolls, and I'm having a good month, but I'm, uh, I'm, you know, certainly drinking too much, way too much, and I know that was, it was a different era, and, Play hard, party far, hard mentality. But I, I, I wasn't happy with myself. You know, I, I just, I, I had enough acknowledgement going, this isn't right, man. And, and whether it's family, whether it's your team, whether it's, I, I'm starting to feel guilty. I'm starting to feel bad about myself. And I'm going, you know, but, I, but if I show any weakness, you know, I think it's weak to say that I got a problem. I can't quite say, even though I went to rehab before, I, I can't quite admit that I, this thing has got hold of me, and little do I know now, obviously, because I can laugh at myself, I can tell stories about myself, players tell stories about me that know even more stories. I, I go, it took courage. It takes courage to to ask, reach out for step. help, yeah. take that step. And I did a little, did that kind of '95. Wasn't all in yet, not at all. But the seeds were planted. Started to understand that you know I was going in the wrong direction, and I I, I was going to need help eventually. Tooth, 97 rolls around, walk into Lou's office. Month in. Lou knew exactly why I was there. He had heard stories. There. Lou, I go, I, they're, they're, you know, and for me to walk away from the game, but and he gently provided that assurance to me that. We'll bring you back. Well, you're, you're part of this family. Yeah. Like he was right away. Nope. Take care of you first, Kenny. So, Lou, I think I got I, I to gotta take care of this problem. And he knew he knew way more than I, I ever believed. You know, you're trying to hide a little bit, and that's what you do, and yeah. sneak around and yep. do your thing. And, it's part of the game. You know, I remember one time coming off a plane in Montreal, I'll never forget. Getting on the plane Thursday, I, you know, no sleep. From a, going out Wednesday night, Lou knew exactly what was going on because he could, you know. Smell everything. Didn't say nothing to me, but he was burning a hole through my, through through my suit. You probably stunk. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that, that, yeah, that, yeah. Obviously, and, that and might have something to do with it. And you had no teeth. You mean the mouthwash and cologne yeah. didn't work? Smell like LeBron. That's the disguise. <laughs> yes. Smell but like... you think you're fooling yeah. everybody. You yeah. Know? And, and don't get me wrong. There was other guys too, probably. But no, I was overboard. Didn't say anything to me though. But I can feel it. I'm nervous. So nervous. Going, you idiot. Slept all the way in the plane. Good night's sleep that night. Play the Canadians. We win 5-1. I think I was third star. And I'd never been a star in Montreal. That was another another dream of mine since young. I used to say in the dressing room, my gregarious personality with the guys, they loved it. I'd say it for a year straight. I have to hear La Toisie La Toi, the third star is selected by Aki Knight in Canada. Ken Dow, I swear to <laughs> I didn't want to be first. Had to be third because I loved that. I used to watch Hockey Night in Canada, watch the Canadians growing up. Sure enough, it it happens. And uh, I think it was in, the, was in the new arena or the old form. I can't even remember because it was right around early in yeah. Lou's tenure. So sure enough, 5-1. Now I'm hooting and hollering, having a good time in the plane and – Thinking everything's swept under the rug. Lou's going to forget I, I performed. I performed. Not a great game. Get off the plane. It's about 1.30 in the morning. Kenny, step in my car, please. I went, oh. Ugh. Gives me the old finger. I go, oh, no. What now? I go, he's, he's going to. So I said, what, what story am I going to come up with now? <laughs> <laughs> he goes, I'm going to keep this brief. 
And he, he's an intimidating man when he gets angry, you know, so horrified again. I had such respect for I have such respect for him. He goes, I know where you were Wednesday. I know how late you were out. He says, God damn, I don't know how you performed to that level in <laughs> Montreal. But if we lost that game, you were gone. Like, oh. whether I was really going to be gone, you know. He, and he was adamant. And uh, I'll, uh, I remember it and sit in that car. And, and then I, I would tighten the, the boot strings a lot. And then I wouldn't, wouldn't go out for a month. Wouldn't drink. Because I did have that fear. Because I did have the respect to Lou. Because I did love my team, you know, and I, and I had to be part of it. And, and now I know I'm playing with fire a little bit. Um, and that was just before 97. And then that's when I went away. And now that it was on their timeline. And the, the league who had, uh, you know, the, the, the program they had in the NHLPA. Yeah. yeah. But everything's still hush hush. But I was the first guy, actually. They had a couple guys that were in, you know, I got that going for me. We joke about it with. My buddy Dan Cronin, who's still involved in National Hockey, and I still talk to him, great guy. I thought they were always out to get you, so you got to sneak around and you're trying to hide things along the way. And it was different back then because I, I don't know if they handled it perfectly at all because I always thought I just didn't want them to hurt my career. But then I went away, and now it's their timeline. Now it's a three-month thing. I go away for a little longer than I wanted, but I'm really sad. i got to get an earnest effort of getting this thing right. And sure enough, uh, I was like fifth in the program all time of their this new program they had. And Dan still talks about it. You're fifth on our charts. We have all the charts, but first to go public. I was the first because it was in season. But Lou, all he said to the media, leave of absence. So he would not tell why I'm away. But put two and two together. I'm sure it was pretty easy. So now I'm ready to come back. And Lou still wants to wait. Wants me to skate more. Wants me to bide my time. I'm a month back, and I'm gonna. I'm losing my marbles. I'm frothing at the bit. I'm like a caged lion. I'm sober. I'm ready to play. I'm, and he keeps holding off. And so I, you know, the owner John McMullen got involved a little bit, and everybody said, "Doc, we called him Doc McMullen." I said, "I'm ready to play." I'm, so, and he got Lou in the phone. Lou says, "Well, it's my timeline. We'll all do it." And Lou says, "Well." Mr. McMullen goes, I'll never forget it. I was like this, but, and he, he gave Lou carte blanche. He had the say of everything because Lou ran everything soup to nuts the ship because he was doing so good. But Doc says, I, you know, I'm going to side on Kenny's, uh, on, on Kenny, I'm going to be on Kenny's side a little bit here, Lou. I could feel the f- steam coming from Lou's head, you know, and eventually it was on Lou's timeline, but Doc was sticking up for me. That's kind pretty of cool saying, for the owner to yeah, do yeah. that. About he goes, player? I've never overruled you ever. He says, but let's think about this one. You know, Kenny's my guy, you know, kind of a yeah. deal. He's been here since day one. He's been there for us. And, you know, and Lou goes, nah, but, you know, it's his responsibility, blah, blah. And he was right. Lou was, Lou was the tough, the tough uncle. Doc was good kind cop, of the cop. good cop, good cop, bad cop yeah. kind of thing. But Lou was a perfect balance because he – he was real hard on me. He had to be. He wouldn't enable me, yet loved me, loyal to me, knew I was yeah. – I had to be – you know, he needed me to to be successful in my role. And it's nice to not be uh, treated like a piece of meat. Piece of meat. And, and, and a lot of – Especially in are, an industry where a lot of times that that's kind of the case. I look back, I take none of that for granted. And now the organization, like that's why I mentioned the owners today and everybody today in the organization, they treat me like gold. Like, geez, I'm, I'm starting to like I, Lou. I, I no. can't. I, yeah, he just hates <laughs> us. I, uh, I, I mean, I could see why you played this long, Dan. And, and I'm sure people listening. It's just the guy that loved the game, was loyal to everyone around him, and it's no surprise at all. Honestly, getting and, to know and, you, well, and now you could catch you smoking stogies before stogies, games. That's my that's your early advice. So I wanted to say to you guys, if you possibly have it, you know, you got a lot of a lot of listeners, a lot of followers. Any cigar guys out there? Those damn things get expensive. All right, and let's. Uh, hey, somebody out there. <laughs> yeah. Who's somebody who out there? Give me a, send a, an advertising. Some oh, I thought you were. Yeah. Start, I thought you were starting an ad read. <laughs> no, 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 no. I said, let's go. No, I'm trying. You guys get me a cigar deal. It would save me on. Uh, All right. Yeah. Uh, yeah our, I'm here, working boys. on Dry Saddles Cologne and, uh, and a few other things. <laughs> so uh, we'll have to get under the cigar. But you know what? Next. Long story short, took me. Uh, it never. It's never a long story short. But <laughs> it took me that I went away in '97. Best thing that I did again, Seeds Planet stayed sober for about 15 months that time and started to indulge again. Couldn't believe it, but but my heart was in the right place. The seeds you were trying, planet, man. Trying my heart out. Then again on my own, I'd stop for another eight months. 
And then near the end, and then 2003, I, for most of the year, somehow just, you know, doing the right thing, stayed sober. Then 2003, my last game, a game seven. What better way to go out yeah, than on, go out on top? I want to say I was watching it, and you were you not balling on the bench? Was Peluso it? was no, that was yeah. ninety five. Peluso was balling. I was no, I wasn't balling, but I was just. Did I, you know I, that was it? That was it because I hadn't played. My yeah, role had diminished. Yeah. I hadn't played the first six games. Right I was already, yeah, you're a healthy scratch the first six uh, games yeah, in the finals, and, and played every playoff game going into that in year Devil's history. in Devils history. Yeah. Pat Burns. God rest his soul. We had a love hate. We we're talking about love hate relationship. We didn't see eye to eye always. Well, you were going out kind of, so, and he's right. I mean, you're a little older. Yeah, and, and I, I got it. And now I reflect. Coaches have the tough decisions yeah. to make, and but I, it was just the way it was handled at times. And I played the first, I don't know, twelve, first, I don't know, maybe eight, nine games of the playoffs, and the streak was a streak. It's it is what it is. I, Lou had mentioned to me, I might be in and out. We need everybody. I know you need. I've already learned. I'm uh, experienced. I'm better to know. You need 26, 27 guys to win cups. I realized where I was at in my career. It was just the way I handled it, and I was hot because I'm still a competitor. If I look back, no, I didn't handle it perfectly either, but, you know, some things were said in the paper and it just that I didn't have a good game. We, we, we played the Bruins. We're, we're uh, up three games to none, so, and then we he's going to sit me out game four, and I was pissed because I didn't – We just you know, won three in a row. We just I won did. three in a row. You could maybe do – I knew I might be out – and and then there was things that was miscommunicated. Papers. Well, he didn't have a very good game in game four. And so me and Pat went at it, and he's a tough hombre too. And Lou heard us screaming in Boston, like at each other. Like I, I still had that fiery temper, but Lou loved that. I had to really get in between us. Media hadn't gotten there yet. Lou didn't want to make sure, and the media saw it. But that's what we loved about our team because we we could go at each other, whether it's coach, the players, because we cared. We wanted to win. I didn't want for the right reasons. Pat was probably right. To, at the time, sent me, but I was I was angry because I'm going. We just won three nothing. You're saying I didn't. Play. How bad could I play? We shut them out. You know what I mean? Yeah. All I, I want them to take the high road at the time and just, you know, we're sliding guys in. But anyway, and, and what transpired? He, it was miscommunication, Pat, with the media and Pat as well. And you know, we all get our egos involved. So I sit and I told Lou. I said, Lou, I understand this. I'm angry. I should be angry, but. I, you know, we had Trevodosky, he was a good young talent, and I end up loving the kid. So then I sit, then I come back, game five, we close out the series. I'm not saying it was because of us. Then the media got all over Pat, and then that even got him him angry. You know, see? Take him out, then he, you put him back in, and we win, you yeah. know? So it was like that that karma thing, you know? And I understood, because he was a fiery guy, just like me. Same yep, personality, yep, yep. and a great coach. So I start playing all the other series. Then we play Ottawa. Who was the best team? We weren't the best team that year. Certainly not in the regular season. They won the President's Trophy. This is going to be a tough series. Eastern Conference Finals. I play the first few, sit a few. I'm okay with that. I get it. You know, we're keeping everybody fresh, and I'm a rolls with So I, we're up 3-1. They come back, make it 3-3. He puts me in game six and seven. I play six and uh, six and seven. Or no, it was 3-2. It puts me in six and seven. We end up winning the series. So now I think I'm starting the Stanley Cup Finals for sure, right? I can play against the best team in the league, game six and seven. Well, certainly you're going to let me fall in game one before <laughs> or change things up. But it's matchups. It's things he informs me before the Stanley Cup finals. You, you know, Kenny, you're going to sit. And I was devastated. But understood it. I was okay because – and, and I, but I'm stewing around. And Lou goes, please, Kenny, be – you know, he, I said, you know, Lou was being really good to me. You know what I mean? Because he got where I was like, Lou, I said, Lou, you, you know who I am. I said, I want to win, and I will lead, and I will not – I will say the right things to the press, do the right thing. I just want to win now. And then I made sure I grabbed Trevodosky, and he still tells me the story, which he respected so much. And he, he I didn't know he heard. I took him into the trainer's room and grabbed him and said, Trev, if you see me going crazy in moment, because I could see he was a little fearful because he knew I was such a fiery guy because he's going to start the Stanley Cup Finals. I said, Trev – you go play your you-know-what off. Play your heart out. You're a hell of a player. This is not against you, bud. If you see me angry, you see me, I need, we need you. You're, Lou said to me four years after, goes, Kenny, I was there for that. I heard, was around the corner. He says, that showed me leadership. And I say this humbly. I'm not patting myself on the back, but it was, I was already at that stage. I just wanted to win. I don't want – I yeah. embraced my teammates. I knew it. As angry as I was not playing. So he plays the first few – 
I, I'm staying ready, thinking I'm going to get in. We win the first two. I know I'm not going to get in. We lose the next two in Anaheim. All right, I'm in game five. Game five, I'm in for sure. Sure enough, he tells me not in, so I'm disappointed. But I'm not still and I said, you know, let's just win. We win game five, three, two, game six. So I, I definitely yep. know I'm not going to be in. And I'm already resigned. In fact, let's just win. I've won cups. I was part of it. I, I just wanted guys that had never won the cup to experience winning a cup because it's, there's nothing like it. And, and game six, we lose. Game seven, I'm already resigned. In fact, I'm done. I'm, I haven't played in two weeks. One game in between, the long travel from Anaheim. We, we don't take the red eye. leave the next morning because it was a Wednesday in Anaheim. Friday night, game seven in New Jersey. Land at about seven at night. Stay at the hotel in Jersey. Team meal. We're ready to walk in team meal. Pat Burns grabs me. He says, Kenny, can you come here for a minute? I hadn't talked to him in two weeks. You know, yeah. <laughs> Basically, he's focused on the team players. I'm not playing. I'm one of the black cases. I'm working my tail off just in case, but I'm already resided. No, no, no. This is good. I, I'm content. You're, takes me, grabs my arm, and goes, you're in tomorrow night. Don't tell anybody. Walks away. That's all he said. Six words, you're in tomorrow night. Don't tell anybody. Didn't want me to tell the press. And walked away from me. I'm like going, like I, 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 I'm, I'm stunned. Tears in my eyes like I'm a rookie. Then I'm going, call my best buddy. Call a family member. I go, you're not going to believe this. He goes, you're in tomorrow night. I, you're in tomorrow night. I go, how the hell would you know? I go, because... I had no idea, and now I think he's making the wrong damn decision. And I was dead serious. I said, I, there's no way I should be in tomorrow night. I said, it's two weeks I haven't played. It's game seven. I'm thinking like a rookie. I'm thinking like I've never played. My buddy, my good buddy Charlie Crispino goes, who I've known, dear friend for 28 years, goes, Kenny, it's like riding a bicycle. You've played in every big game in this team's history. You've played 1,283 hockey games, and you're nervous? Are you crazy? So he kind of had to nice. relax me. Yeah. Okay. He says, "This is." He says, he's doing it for a reason. Well, apparently, game seven, you want every little intangible. And I knew, I think I played just under 12, about 11.53 of ice time. And, you know, but I just don't want to make a mistake to cost the Stanley exactly. Cup because guys haven't won the Cup here. Like, I, that was where my head was going, regardless of the experience, regardless of how long I played. Yeah, then before the game, I was my old self. And loud in the room and getting everybody fired up. So all that went away. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then when the press did not know, I was just going for warm-up. And then when they announced right before the game, and I wasn't the healthy scratch. You know? And the fans went nuts. And oh, like, that's I sick. could hear thunderous for, in the room. And I'm going, I, could probably, I had goosebumps. I was yeah. ready to cry again because when these fans are unbelievable. Like, they were – that's why Pat put me in. I didn't think they'd be that excited, but – when nuts. First time I touch the puck, every time I touch the puck, they're going crazy. I'm going, shut up. You're making me nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Put your earplugs in. I just, I just want to do my little part. But Pat goes, Pat, tell, after the series, I said, Pat, you know, I knew that was it for me. And I jumped on the glass, was shaking every fan's hand and thanking everybody and family. And I stayed on forever. And then I went to Pat's office and said, Pat, you know, I know we didn't see eye to eye, man, all the time. And I know you had tough decisions and I don't give a damn. We just won the Stanley Cup. And, what a story. and I'm forever indebted to you for putting me in game seven when I damn well thought that was the worst decision you ever made. <laughs> and he got a little smile. I handed him a cigar. <laughs> and because Pat was a cigar guy too. And like I said, God rest his soul. And I, you know, you find as we had a big hug and he's a big gruff guy and not as sentimental at times. And he goes, Kenny, there was no question you were going in like game seven. He says, we needed that little edge. Your teammates love you. They, I, they needed to see you in the room. The fans were going to get a little more emotional, a little fired up. We needed that little intangible, regardless how much you played. And he says, I talked to Scott Stevens uh, on the plane, and I said to Scotty, what do you think? I'm thinking of putting Daniel back in game seven. And Scotty said, it's a no-brainer. Put him in. So That's that awesome. meant That's a lot. That's a great yeah, meant, story, man. meant a ton to me. And then I said, Pat, like I said, we wanted to slug each other a few times. Oh, yeah. But That's I a storybook ending. <laughs> yeah, storybook ending. Because you know I'm done. You know? <laughs> and I said, this is it. This was game seven. And, yeah, I had a lot of fun after that. Where we were going back yeah. 2003 and didn't have to be in as good a shape. Didn't have to, you know, stay in that 
game mode, game mentality, where I did have a lot of discipline and did respect my teammates and, and, and Lou and the owner and everybody. So now the, the fun began. The organ, I was still in the organization, but I'm, you know, a lot of late nights, a lot of craziness, a lot of partying, um, you know, and, and, and it just was off and on. And I was one foot in, one foot out. Always, I already knew what I was. Once you're, I always say, you know, you, my saying is now, once you're a pickle, you never can become a cucumber. And I wanted to go back to being a cucumber. I wanted to be that that heavy drinker that had fun. I wanted to be that fun, heavy drinker, and I couldn't get back to that. I just could You know, I had some successful nights. Successful to me was when I got home by 2 in the morning. You know oh, what I mean? Yeah. But it's playing Russian roulette. Yeah. Because the alcohol takes over. And I never knew whether it was 10 at night I get home or 10 in the morning. You know what I mean? And now you're, you're playing with fire. Now I don't have as much responsibility. I don't have to play, and it was a battle. Yep. And I, not to get too no, it's long, hard long of a, a diatribe, but when it, it took so people thought you're still sober all the time. And yeah. it, from 2003 to 2000, what is it, 21? No, it's 10 years. No, two, this, uh, August 9th, 2011 is my sobriety date uh, and, and coming up again. And I had some bi- bu- uh, stints with sobriety from 2003 when I retired to then, but everybody thinks you, you just get it after I went to rehab yeah. in 97. No, that those seeds were planted. It took me twenty years to get ten years. If yeah, that makes yeah. any sense, of battling and and sticking with it and falling down and dusting myself off. So I always say to anybody that is struggling at all ever, don't give up. Don't think then it, 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 it can't you can't do it. Because if I could, because I was stubborn as a mule, I'm the guy that believed I could overcome anything. Finally, because. Because I asked for help, because those seeds were planted, because I became vulnerable and said, you know what, I may be tough. I'm not tough enough for this. I I, I can't do it. I, uh, you know, I had told my wife now, <sighs> story back in right around the time I, you know, 2011. I had a little incident, things that I won't get into, but that was a turning stone. Like I was off and on. I said to my my, she was my girlfriend at the time. She goes, you know, Kenny, you, you, you got to make a decision here. What are you doing? I says, screw it. I said, I got one foot in, one foot out. I, 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 I just, I'm not comfortable. In sobriety, I'm not comfortable being out all the time. So I'm going to play Russian roulette. I'm going to have fun because I had some fun. It's not like I sat at home. I was an outgoing guy out. I didn't sit at home. You know, It's all relative, yeah, yeah. but I didn't sit at home and Drink. isolate. Yeah. And I had to be in the you're, party. You're a fun, fun I had party. to be with people. I had to have the action. I'm an action junkie. So I told her that, well, something happened that kind of curbed that. Come home, scared me enough. And they say you can't get scared straight, but it certainly helps. You yep, know? Yep. And, our, and plus, I had all the seeds planted and a couple of rehabs behind me. Something happened that transpired, and I don't want to get into it, but it, I, I go I go home that fearful enough I was going to lose everything. My family, my you know, two young kids that I, you know, are 26 and 22 now. My son goes to Berkeley College of Music, very talented, tough school to get in. Oh I'll throw God, that in. Is. Yeah. So he has his own passion, found his own thing. But they needed me at that time. They're teenagers. I'm going, you know, that I, 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 I got to be there for them. My team, the Devils, are my family. I, you know, they're going to stick with me so long. But the light bulb went on. They can't stick with you forever if you if things continue to snowball, you know. And an incident happened. I come home and I'm scared enough and a little depressed for a couple days. And two days go by and I, I tell my girlfriend at the time, now my wife, I go, Margaret, I'm done. It's over. I kind of had that little spiritual awakening. Call it what you want. Moment not of to more moment yeah. of clarity. Something happened. The desire was gone. And, and you know. Got my knees, asked the big fella upstairs, I can't, man. I need help. I'm done. I can't do this. You know, I can't go back and forth. It's just, it's draining, and, you know, I'm not going to live forever if, if I continue this path. But I believed it this time. You think you're invincible. You think you're going you know, to accomplish anything because I was able to play 20 years. I'm tough. I fought some of the toughest guys in the league. Did what I had to do. You know, I deserve this. You know, and no, I didn't deserve this because I was – killing my life you know and then when this incident happened i told her and all of a sudden I told my wife she was yeah 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 sure i've heard this a million times I, said, I won't tell you again i said i'm done i knew something was different 
It was great. So and I already had the seeds planted. Didn't go away again. Did go, you know, to a few counselors, a few things to help me along, to get me back acclimated. But the desire left. And then a year goes along. I hadn't had a drink. I was responsible. I was doing all the right thing. My, my, my girlfriend at the time, we were living together. She goes, now, like I said, now my wife, she goes, you weren't shitting, were you? You, mm-hmm. you meant this. I said, no, I told you. She goes, you've had no desire? I go, no, it's a miracle. I said, I said it's a miracle. I, it just left. I said, because that moment of clarity, and yes, I did get on my knees and say, I need help. I can't do this on my own. I've tried it. I'm, I, I believe I'm a pretty damn tough guy, but it's not weakness to ask for help. Nope. You know what I mean? And, 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 and now I have had many parents and young kids come up, and any time they want to talk about it, I say, no, if I yeah. can help you, because I need to give back, because that keeps me sober. And I've not had a desire to have drink. And I'm still a nut, as yeah. you guys see, and have a and lot of fun. You need to write a book. And yeah. still, you need to write a book. And we're uh, we're very appreciative. We have you know a lot of fans who struggle with whatever it is, yeah. and I'm sure your message. Whether is Whether it's addiction, whether it's mental health, health, yeah. health, health, whatever, maybe. This is my area where I didn't think I could get it. I thought I was a goner. I, I think it, I, I think it helps people here when a, when a, a person of your stature can be vulnerable and, and you know everything that you've accomplished. So And uh, that's we about appre- in August 9th coming up. I mean, I'm very yeah. happy for you 10 years and this is an amazing interview. We could probably sit you know here what? for 6 hours yeah. then. Oh, I thought we already I, have been. I, 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 I think they have the studio for, I, I think somebody's going oh, to somebody's trying I to didn't do think it. Be this on, but I want to say one last thing. So they, when when we look back at, at all that, I mean it is. It's, it's not a. You, you, if I can fight through it, it's amazing because I didn't believe I could. And, and no, you got it. Well, this story. I don't care how you weave this in. This is the one you. Did you hear the Ty Domi story with me? No. No. Because we we, we we talked a lot about everything, but we got to have a fun story. So this is at a nightclub. All right, great way to end it. A good way to end it. We have to tell. I know this is all over. You guys can fit it in wherever you. No, want. right oh, now. Because no, 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 Ty Domi wrote this in his book, and he had a very successful book. I hated Ty Dummy, the passion. He hated me. He was a young kid, though. Always come after me as a young kid. To, I was already like, every time I went to New York, he'd, I'd go, here comes Domi again, because I was the guy that would oblige. And he thanked me, by the way, when he went to Toronto, lined up against me, and I was getting older. He was, oh, we're not fighting anymore, Kenny. I'm so grateful that you fought me. Like, he gave me that respect because you let me get my feet wet, you know, when, when I had to make a name for myself. But And we're great friends to this day, so another guy. But... So Mark Messier's with the Rangers, as Ty Domi is, Mark's with me. So we China Club was the big nightclub. Oh, All yeah. the celebrities went. I was a regular Monday nights. This place was hopping. They loved me. I I I was in heaven. I loved the fact that you know, starstruck seeing all these celebrities. I drank shots with Sean Penn, to name a few. Yeah, I'll name drop a little bit. Uh-huh. So I'm thinking I'm dying. He's on a heaven. bad man, isn't right? he? Back then, yeah. Man, you know, it's just we all were <laughs> madmen back in the day. But that was just one name. I just a lot of people hung around, and they loved me because I was just one of those crazy ath- athlete guys. That, and I was enamored by some of these guys. So, so it was pretty cool. So all of a sudden, a bunch of the Rangers walk in, and I'm the, and but Mark's there. So obviously, I give Mark a hug and. And then there's Domi, and I go, oh, God. Brian Leach, who I loved, had respect. So there's a few of them walk in. Monday night, we both, both teams didn't play for a while. We weren't going to play them for a couple weeks. So, okay, I'm going to have fun. Hey, Kenny, how are you, man? Have a good time. So Ty's with him. And Ty put this in his book, and it's, it's a great story. So Mark goes, Mark's egging us on. Everybody's having a few drinks. And Mark's going, Ty, I'm telling you, you know, I grew up with this kid, and I'm older than Ty, about 10 years old or whatever, maybe. Strong, one of the stronger guys I've ever seen, talking about me. And then he goes, Kenny, Ty's strong as a bull. And he was like, built like a fire hydrant. He says, you two got to have an arm wrestle. I want to put a little wager on this. So, you know, and I think I was a little more lit up than Ty was at the time. I was having a good time, but absolutely, let's go. And I'm a competitor. I competed at everything. I hate to lose at anything. So come on, Mark. Okay, sure. So we get a table. The bouncers around. Everybody's watching. Ty Domi and Ken Danico have an arm wrestle. Goes pretty good. Sure enough, he beats me. Like I, uh, so we do the other arm. He beats me again. And Ty's, you know, sh- short arms, powerful as hell. And he, I can tell you that when I fought him, one of the toughest guys I've ever fought. So I lose both, and I'm angry. I'm pissed. Well, I and you're drunk. Not very yeah, and, and lit and not very smart. I grab him, I say, massive headbutt. Now, who's going to headbutt Ty Domi at the time? I'm pretty crazy and have a pretty hard head. 
That might be the hardest head he's in a the, ram. the history of he's a ram. The history of the now, I do it again. I'm go, I, I'm angry. It's 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 an all-out brawl. Punches are starting to get thrown. Every Marcos, you like the, like <clears throat> the parent up top going, "You two idiots, stop!" Bouncers get it. <laughs> He goes, this was a friendly arm wrestle. <laughs> yeah, those are really, like really Mark friendly. Angry at bowlers, and I, I just, and we totally settled down right away. I go to practice the next day because he heard from our trainer. I got a goose egg sticking out of my head. The wealth of my head from headbutt and tie domey was ridiculous. And I had a $100 bet with him that wasn't paid that night because I ended up leaving. Sure enough, we play him two weeks. He says, tie put his way. He says, can't believe it. Danico sends a envelope down with the $100 bill and, with from a one of the trainers because I had to I had to pay up I, I lost fair what a story. so angry so here's the China Club there's actors there there's other celebrities there there's the bouncers these two young dumb hockey players are headbutting I look back and I go I can't believe I really did crap like that <laughs> but it's great it was fun at the time yeah yeah can it just it, it's hard to fathom because I'm such a different person today you know but. I laugh at it, and when my buddies go out to drink, say, does, does it bother you when we drink around? He said, you guys can drink around me all want. I spilt more than you guys drank. <laughs> yeah. Have at it, and I'm glad you can do it successfully. Yes. I said, I wanted to be that. Well, I'll tell you what. We're I gonna, couldn't. We're going to line up We're gonna line up a rematch with Ty, and we're going to get that arm wrestle. Oh, back. boy. I'm going to start cranking the yeah, weights, buddy. I, I, make sure you tell me about two months advance so I get to the gym a little bit more. Because <laughs> yeah. apparently I had found out Ty had never lost it. Arm wrestle in history. That was still has his it. forte. At the, and we're still in touch. But he put that in his book, so I'm not telling him that school. He spins it that he hammered me. No, they were good matches. <laughs> there we go. But I lost. Yes, salt I pepper lost. On the stage. There we go. Well, I thank know, you well, so Dan, much. Oh, thank you so much. I know you actually. You wanted to mention your business event, your latest business oh, venture. Well, I, I had that written down. I, did, I you, you know what? You guys are the best. I, I get going on, man. No, I could stay with you guys. I, I got to take a quick piss. Yeah, yeah, Give me one. So. No, like I said, it's very brief Yeah, because I'm really excited about a new venture, a new technology platform that connecting fans and players. So just go to our website, signed.com, S-I-G-N-D.com. Follow us on Instagram or Facebook and at signed, S-I-G-N-D slash lower lower slash official for the launch details and legendary giveaways. Now, I want to say this, and I read that because I have to look at everything just started. And I'm real excited about it. I've had a lot of things that I've gotten involved in, with over the years, but this is something where I was at a, a little function and, and we did a little advertisement for it. The great Larry Holmes, the champ, uh, um, OJ Anderson, who's one of the brains behind the operation, Super Bowl MVP, many more, the entertainment world. It's going to be pretty cool. Nice. I hope it takes off, but it's 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 coming out soon, and where the fans really get to interact, memorabilia is involved, personal messages. It's going to be, it's going to be a, uh, it's something I look at. A new go, Facebook. It, it, it could be fantastic. Don't These guys have the done all guys. Their, their homework, but I, I mean, we go. Uh, uh, I, I can't remember the names because I'm so bad at. It, but from, uh, 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 What's the group I'm looking? Wu Tang Clan. Oh, okay, all right. Now, uh, yeah. now we're up. This is the plethora. I wouldn't of, have guessed them in a million yeah, years. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and wonderful guy. Uh, nice. Right. Method Man. No. Oh. The name the uh, baby uh, something face. Ghostface Killer. Ghostface oh, Killer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I apologize to Ghostface. This was the first time I met him. Loved them, but they're all involved in this, and like it's nice. pretty neat. Okay, nice. Yeah, so Check maybe out maybe you'll get a verse. The on The younger track. generation oh. got it, but it, what an awesome person! I can't believe you know. Ghostface. And I apologize, Ghostface, because he was a great guy. <laughs> Won't forget again. <laughs> well, Dan, <laughs> thanks, unreal, fellas. Unreal yeah. interview. Thank you so much. Congrats really appreciate on everything, it. and congrats. More importantly, not the cups, but August 9th coming up. Ten years. Very happy for you. Thank you, man. Thank awesome. you. Great being on with you guys. Had a lot of fun. Our pleasure, Ken. <laughs> I want to send a huge thanks to Kenny Danico. He came in studio and met us uh, about a month or so back. I think it was G. Unreal storyteller. This guy, I mean, he didn't have high prospects, like he said, coming up and ended up with a 20-year career all at the same team, a, a legendary career, great guy. And Easy for you guys, too, there. Nice yeah. and easy. <laughs> yeah, man, yeah. He kind of, like, wind, wind him up and watch him go. Yeah, he uh, he had some notes there, but he it was incredible, the stuff he knew off the top of his head. So 
Uh, great having him. And uh, we got a couple more coming up. But we did mention Scott Gomez, part two, is going to be coming in a few weeks. Absolute classic, that guy is. And also former Canadians goaltender Jose Theodore. Uh, fantastic interview with him coming as well. So plus a couple other names that we haven't thrown out there yet. So got some good stuff coming to hold you over until the next season starts. But in the meantime, I want to tell you about Sezzle. Sezzle is a buy now, pay later solution that allows you to get what you want today while paying for it over time in four interest repayments over six weeks. Sezzle is now available at the Barstool Sports Store and more than 35,000 exciting stores in the USA and Canada. There are no hidden fees and no credit check if you pay on time with zero impact to your credit score. Sezzle is easy to use, offering instant approval decisions with no long forms to fill out. Just sign up and get an instant approval decision. You can use Sezzle to grab the latest Chicklets merch like bathing suits and tie-dye NBD gear. And yeah, NBD gear. So go to the Boston Sports Store and shop now and pay later with Sezzle. Gee, I mentioned the bathing suits. It's almost the end of the summer, the tie-dye stuff. We got a bunch of other stuff coming. Let the folks know. All right, Thursday. Thursday is the big day this week where we have tons of merchandise dropping. Everyone for a long time has been asking me about these MBD hats I've been wearing, and I've been kind of testing them out for the past month or two. It's my favorite hat. Uh, so those go on sale this Thursday. We also have this unisex tie-dye uh, set, Pink Whitney tie-dye set that's also going to be on sale. So get it for your girlfriend, get it for your boyfriend. People are going to love it. And then there's also just tons of new spit and chiclets and MBD merch. Uh, Ryan, this whole weekend, this past weekend at street hockey was wearing the new lounge shorts. He dubbed them the com- comfiest shorts he's ever worn. So barstoolsports.com slash chiclets, check it out there. And uh, it's going to move quick. So, so get your hands on it. Yeah. I love the, uh, the tie dye shorts. You just come out with those are super comfy. I think honestly, I mean, not, not that I'm the fashion maven of the show anyways, but all I wear is, the gym shorts we make from Chicklets, NBD, just super comfy, man. Like I said, I look good when I have to, G. I just haven't had a look good lately. All right, and those in those pink Whitney tie dye shorts, like I just said, they're they're unisex. So like, if you, you want to let your girlfriend wear them, your girlfriend can wear them. You want you want to wear them, you can wear them. So it's it's pretty awesome, man. And uh, I'm actually really excited for this drop. This this has been like three or four months in planning, so we're excited. Good job, buddy. And if you want to wear them both at the same time, you can try that as well. <laughs> Give it a whirl, as they say. Uh, gee, I know this is like the downtime for us. I'm trying to catch up. There's so many movies, TV shows. Actually, yeah, no, what are you watching right now, man? Actually, I take that back. There's not a lot of movies because the pandemic has put such a hold on, on the amount of movies that have come out. Um, I did watch that the new Suicide Squad the other day. And I said I didn't think it was good. And the internet was letting me have it. And I'm like, oh, you're too old. You don't get comic book movies. I'm like, dude, I've been watching these for 40 years since Superman back in the 70s. Like, I do like comic book movies. I just... I put it on. I thought the first half hour was decent. And then it was like, God, man, this is kind of a shit show. And I just, it didn't do a lot for me. I think what happened was the first one was so bad that the only way to go was up. And I think people like thought this one, it was so much better than the other one, but compared to other movies, I don't know. I, I, and it's not because of silliness. I mean, it's a comic book movie. I'm not looking for, you know, reality here, but I don't know, man, the last 80 minutes of it, which is meandering all over the place. And it lost me. I haven't heard like a ton of great stuff about it. I mean, I heard it was good. I haven't seen it yet, but I heard it was good. I didn't hear it was great. I've seen a few people online saying it was trash. So I don't think you're completely in the minority there. Yeah, it's just, you know, I know James Gunn made Guardians of the Galaxy, which I thought was better, but I watched it. Maybe I'll give it a whirl again and maybe I'll see it different. But what I what I have been hooked on lately, no pun intended, Cocaine Cowboys, the Kings of Miami. Uh, directed Billy Corbin. He directed the original Cocaine Cowboys. I want to say back in 2006, there was a second movie he came out with, documentary that came out with. And then this is a six-part documentary series about these two guys, the Kings of Miami. They were basically, you know, late teens, early 20s, started selling cocaine when it was all the rage over the country. And, I mean, these guys had a, a billion-dollar empire. And it, it goes Wait, did you whole, say two teens? They were start, I think they were late teens when they started. Like, Jesus. I think they were in high school when they started selling it. And then, you know, into their early, mid-20s, they were... I mean, they were bona fide kingpins. I mean, moving like tons and tons of like literal tons of cocaine every week. The amount of money and like product is is absolutely staggering when you see the videos. But it's an interesting history of Miami, too. Sort of like the original cocaine cowboys. Like when you look at the skyline of Miami in the 70s, Mike, there was a few buildings, but it was like nothing. And then all this like illicit money came in and, you know, it, it made Miami the dazzling place it is today. Like South Beach wasn't even 
a, really a thing like in the early 70s. And because all this money and cash and pizzazz sort of built up Miami over the years. Where did that Island come from, exploded. though? Was that was that from the drugs, Columbia. like the money and stuff? In- oh, yeah, 100 percent. I, I mean, I'm sure there's probably a, a statistic, soon, but I, I mean, there's probably half of the skyline of Miami is probably financed by illicit money over the last what? 40 years. This is out of here. So much coming in. And when you watch this documentary, you could see why when when two guys are making this much money and I mean, everybody else working for them. And that's only two people in one city. You can't imagine like other states, other places is just how much like uh, how much blow America was doing back in the <laughs> 80s which is which is probably the real obscene thing of this but well, I'm happy well, what did you what what movie did you say I mean not movie what magazine did you say there was like it was on the cover of the magazine some got someone doing cocaine oh it was, it was like a bowl of cocaine it or was something time it was time magazine uh which I know it doesn't have the cachet it used to but it was a it was a cocktail glass full of cocaine it was I want to see 1980 and it was like is cocaine bad for you or cocaine dangerous or something yes. along those lines showing how, you know, how ignorant people were about just how, how bad it was eventually going to get for people. But yeah, it was just a potty drug for rich people that, you know, exploded. And then everybody in this system was doing it seemed back, back in the day. And yeah, these two guys, man, they, they made a bundle off it. I haven't finished it yet. I'm about, I think halfway through, but uh, I've been watching that. And then I finished on HBO um, Sunday night, the white Lotus. I've talked about it on the, the show a couple of times. It's a lot of high praise, a lot of yeah. high praise for that show. Yeah. It's uh it's a, it's a funny little show. It's about uh, six episodes long. It's about this rich people's resort out in Hawaii and like all the interactions between the staff. It's, it's like a social satire. The guy, I think I mentioned before, Mike white wrote it. He wrote school of rock, uh, orange County, uh, bunch of other stuff. Brilliant, brilliant writer. And it's just wrote- like a slow comedy type show. It's just like nice and nice and easy for yeah. you. Yeah. Like you, you realize the first scene of the first episode that they, they show a, a a coffin while well, getting loaded into a plane. So you right away, you know, from the first two minutes, somebody dies. So that's kind of like lingering over the whole show. And yeah, it's it just kind of, like I said, it's like a, a kind of a satire, like uh, rich people and the people who work around them. And I, I got a kick out of it. I thought it was very entertaining, very well written. So if you have, right, you know what I saw this week was, uh, and I loved it because I was pretty young when this happened was the malice at the palace documentary. I don't know if you've seen that on Netflix, but Holy shit. That yeah. was fucking insane. And I had no idea that it, it escalated to that level. And I didn't even know that the guy who who launched the beer on uh, to, to start the whole thing, he wasn't even the guy that got bum rushed. Yeah. Yeah. It was like slap shot when they go in. Is this the guy? He's like, yeah, that's him. And they beat the guy who didn't, didn't even throw the keys on the ice. Yeah, I did. I did catch it. I thought it was very good because they had all the principals involved talking about it. And, you know, you didn't realize like, how easily that could have been avoided. I mean, that guy throwing that drink, it, it was like a grenade that set everything off. And it was crazy. Cause like Ron Artest said, like he had stepped away to sit on the bench because like his meditation coach told him like, yeah. take five seconds to cool down. And while he's cooling down, some dude yeah. just launches a beer on his head. It's like, yeah, well, he did lay on the scores table. Not exactly. Yeah. The bench, yeah, which, like an which, ass, yeah. Which was unusual, but still the guy who threw the thing was, that was, that made it uh, out of control. And then like those idiots, like the two guys who, who ran down the bench and they're like, Oh, somehow we ended up by the bench. It's like, yeah, assholes. You walk down there and fucking try to start a fight with NBA guys and lucky didn't get your face broken. And he squares up too, like, right when, right when our test looks at him, he like, he squares yeah. up. So it's like, dude, come on. You were going down there for one reason and one reason only. And that was to start yeah. shit. And then, well, they, they, that was the guy who, well, I test slipped, but the other guy was doing the interview who Jermaine O'Neal punches. And he was like, he was trying to play the victim. It's like, buddy, you're down on the, on the floor, dude, during a game. You shouldn't be anywhere near there. And like, especially what, what was going on. I mean, probably dude, imagine if punched. O'Neal connected there. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Probably would have busted his face and then even when they're coming off the court all the shit people are throwing at him i hadn't seen a lot of that video before it's just it was just a crazy time and then the way the nba reacted after was kind of somewhat of an overreaction and you can't trust this way anymore and it was like i uh, just a- so shocked to see the the public uh outcry against the players and like obviously the players there's no reason the players should ever go into the stands that's obviously unacceptable but like the fact that everyone was against the players just kind of blew my mind. Yeah. And I, I like to like, it was like, you know, o- O'Neal, Steven Jackson, and I test like three guys are a little bit out there too. I think one of the players was like, yeah, you got to throw those three guys together. You do this stuff. Shit might happen. I, I forget who said I'm paraphrasing obviously, but, and then even like Reggie Miller, he was like the old veteran kind of from an old school guy, a different mentality of, from these guys. And 
you know, you could see the heartbreak in him because the paces were goddamn good. I mean, they were. Uh, that was his final know, season, wasn't it? I, I'm not sure if it was, but it was definitely one of his final shots as a, to be a contender. I mean, and they were going to be a contender that year, and that kind of torpedoed their season. So you kind of got the Reggie Miller heartbreak. Not that I was a big Reggie Miller fan when he played, but it was, you know, kind of, he kind of represented sort of the old school, you know, he goes back to the bird, Jordan. Oh, yeah. And to have him like, guys, let's just play fucking basketball here. And, it didn't play out that way. So good call on that one. Gee, that was enjoyable as well, but I got a bunch more, man. I don't know if I'm going to watch old movies, old shows, but I'm going to bury myself in my Roku for the next few weeks and catch up on some stuff. Should throw a blog out there. All right. Should throw yeah. a blog about all these old ones. Cause I, yeah. I, I sit there at night and I don't even know what to watch. Yeah. I got, I got a couple, couple in the chamber, a um, few recommendations. Well, I probably talked about them on here too, but yeah, I'll absolutely have, have a few recommendations come out this week. So if I, anyone wants to, to tag along, feel free, but Gee, any last last thoughts for this episode before we uh, call it a day or what? Well, two things. Just one that to reiterate, you can buy the merch Thursday. And two, for all those people out there listening to this uh, via podcast, let's give it a try on YouTube. You can see the guys' faces now. You can see the interviews in person. It's actually really cool to see uh, you guys' reactions in real time to some mm-hmm. of these stories. So uh, just check us out on YouTube. Just type spit and chicklets in on the uh, search bar and Give us a subscribe, and I, I promise there's tons of cool new content there that uh, the podcast provides. Also, our reactions to each other when our co-hosts say some <laughs> silly things in the face. I think that's what say. I mean more. Yeah, yeah, there's definitely some some doozies there. So, all right, buddy, good job today, and uh, that'll wrap up episode 348. I hope you enjoyed Ken Danico, and we'll be back next week. Have a great week, everybody. 